ओके वी आर लाइव नाउ वेलकम टू ऑर्थो टीवी ऑनलाइन एजुकेशन वेबिनार दिस इज स्पाइन कनेक्ट सीरीज यू वुड लाइक टू थैंक ऑल आर फैकल्टी फॉर शेयरिंग दर नॉलेज एंड एक्सपर्टीज विद ऑल स्पेशली इन सच चैलेंजिंग टाइम we wish all our audience a healthy and safe days ahead and we hope these webinars add value to your time these webinars are dependent on internet speed which might be at times unstable so please bear with us if for any issues with the internet all information and academics discussed in the webinar are sourced by the speakers from reliable sources however please use the information provided in the webinar only after confirming with standard teaching the opinions in the webinar are for academic purposes only and are not a substitute to evidence so the speakers neither the portal is responsible for any untoward events caused due to information presented in the webinar so over to dr shailesh adgaonkar the moderator of today's webinar on spine connect series hi good uh, good evening everyone uh, this is the third uh, webinar of spine connect with pune orthopedic uh, association and pune association of spine surgeons i welcome you all uh, uh, the international master dr ajay joshi uh, president uh, ex president uh, association of spine surgeons of india dr raghav dat uh, president of pune orthopedic society karne sir and my dear uh, colleagues uh, today's agenda is lumbar instability we are going to discuss the common problems which we all uh, see in uh, our uh, spine practice of lumbar instability and different ways to deal with it no one is right or no one is wrong everyone has their own way of understanding about these instabilities and different ways to treat someone will feel short segment fixation i have very good experience someone feels that i have long segment and i'll fix it and i will get away better someone will talk about only decompression and someone will talk about pain blocks and non surgical so it's it's a different array of treatment which can be right and you know we are not seeing any clinical patient here we are just talking from the x rays and mris so i think we will all be there and we'll try to uh, understand ourselves educate ourselves i would like to introduce my uh, esteemed uh, faculty and guest today uh, dr ajay joshi who is uh, practicing as a spine surgeon in san antonio in texas us he is uh, uh, there since uh, quite a long time and he is one of the inventors in uh, uh, the uh, webter what we all know of deformity correction and ajay is doing a great uh, job in uh, texas and we look forward to see you and association with you ajay thank you for joining us Uh, i would like to welcome uh, dr raghav dat raghav sir is uh, ex president of association of spine surgeon of india and one of the most eminent prominent figure in spine society all over the country and abroad we know raghav sir has got extensive experience in early onset scoliosis pediatric deformities in spine as well as degenerative spine and he is practicing seeing at apollo hospital hyderabad and udai clinic in hyderabad we welcome you sir uh, mm -hmm. for joining with us today uh, our next esteemed uh, guest is dr gururaj uh, from uh, indian spine injury center dr gururaj is uh, the unit in charge at indian spine injury center and doing phenomenal work in spinal deformity adult degenerative spine as well as the advanced spine surgery like robotic and uh, minimal invasive surgery we welcome you uh, guru uh, gururaj for this webinar today and he will be moderating along with me as well we uh, welcome uh, dr uh, neeraj basawada we all know neeraj is a true academician and he is practicing at shalbi hospital he has got extensive experience in dealing with this kind of uh, complex spinal issues deformities uh, pediatric as well as adults and we welcome you neeraj for today's uh, webinar and he also will be moderating with us today our esteemed faculty Thank next you. one is dr pradeep singh who is practicing as the head of the department at uh, hiranandani hospital mumbai pradeep is a thorough academician he has got extensive research as well as clinical practice and we all know his work in degenerative adults and deformities is extremely appreciated we welcome you pradeep today for uh, this webinar uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, dr raghavendra we all know raghavendra is extensively trained in france with daniel chopin uh, and he is practicing in bangalore as a eminent spine surgeon uh, he is practicing mainly the, uh, the degenerative spine deformity as well as adult degenerative work and uh, raghavendra is attached at wokard uh, and columbia asia hospital in bangalore and 
few other centers in Bangalore and periphery. We welcome you, Mayor Raghavendra. Our next guest is Dr. Vivek Vincent. Dr. Vincent is uh, trained in uh, Pune as well as in uh, Japan, and he's practicing at Trishur uh, near Kochi in Metropolitan Hospital, which is a teaching hospital as well as a private hospital. And we welcome you, Dr. Vincent, today for this uh, webinar. Um, our next faculty is Dr. Mayur Kardile. Mayur is practicing in Pune. He is extensively trained in uh, Pune as well as in the US. And Mayur has got extensive experience in uh, minimally invasive surgery and the anterior surgery in spine. He is practicing at uh, Jahangir Hospital, Pune. We welcome you, Mayur. And our last faculty, Dr. Uh, Kunal Shah. We all know Kunal is uh, a, a vibrant young surgeon practicing in Wokhart and Raheja Hospital, Raheja Fortis Hospital uh, as a consultant in Mumbai. And Kunal is uh, doing a phenomenal good work. He's specialized mainly in minimally invasive degenerative spine work and he's got extensive publications in uh, this uh, as well. We welcome you Kunal for today's webinar and uh, uh, I would like uh, our uh, master, the real uh, support and backbone to Pune Orthopedic Society, Dr. Narayan Karne, without whose support this webinar was not possible and his persistence that we should do our webinar series. And this is what we are here with our third of the four series. Uh, uh, Dr. Narayan Karne is a very senior orthopedic surgeon uh, with extensive experience. He is dealing with orthopedic as well as spine in his last 30, 35 year practice. And he looks after two major hospitals in Pune city. So we, we welcome you, Dr. Karne, and over to you for this webinar, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shailesh. Good evening, friends, and good morning, Dr. Ajay at Texas. Well, we welcome, we welcome all delegates for this Spine Connect webinar on the lumbar instability and the implant failure. Uh, these are the very common problems and especially after the uh, recent start of the uh, implant fixation, the implant failure has increased a lot. We see this from the general orthopedic surgeon's point of view where uh, they see more spine patients in their own OPD, but generally they don't go beyond surgery. So, these orthopedic surgeons will have all the ideas about the strategies in spine implant images, how the masters they do here. Here, you will see the evidence and the experience with the galaxy of the eminent spine surgeons like the International Master of Dr. Joshi from the Pune Orthopedic Society, and Dr. Agha Dutta, who is the of the Association of And we thank the other faculties, Dr. Guru Raj from the Pune Yasada from Ahmedabad, Dr. Konosha from Mumbai, Dr. Kansan from Mumbai, Dr. Vincent from the Pune, and our own man, Dr. Well, I uh, I'm sure that this is going to be a great academic feast. So, to all the basics as well as the advanced spine surgeons, I thank Dr. Sharesh Hargavkar as well as the Association of Spine Surgeons to have this great feast. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Stay home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind wishes. And uh, we uh, proceed to the webinar today. Uh, our agenda today is mainly lumbar instability and implant failure and how do we deal with it. Our uh, basic is that we will start with case-based discussions because that is what is the uh, need of the hour and we get a lot of feedback that people want to know about case-based scenarios mainly. Therefore, we have kept it the same way. I would like to request Dr. Guru Raj to start with his cases and uh, this forum is open to all. Uh, yes, is Neeraj is around? Neeraj? I think he has some issue. Yeah. Yes, Guru Raj. Uh, you, you, you will have to say Neeraj Vasavda or Neeraj Bidlani because there are two Neerajis are there. Yeah, Neeraj, Neeraj Vasavda, yes. Yeah. Yes, Guru Raj, over to you. Please share your screen. We have sent the uh, uh, SMS uh, of the number on the all the flyers. Kindly send if you have any queries. Uh, Dr. Pradyuman Rati will uh, share it with all of us and we can uh, discuss the questions as well. Guruaj, you need to uh, unmute yourself. Should I start with the instability presentation or we'll start with the case first? I think uh, case first and then instability. That's better. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, let's start. 
with the cases. One moment. Yeah. Can you see the uh, screen? Yeah, we can. We can. We can. Okay. okay. We can see your fellows have done a lot of work for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so. So that's the case. Uh, it's one of the uh, you can say googly. Uh, so for a, for a look of it, uh, basically a seventy-year-old lady presented with the low back pain and radiated to left lower legs. It's not opened up yet, Guru. Okay. Okay. Is it seen by uh, you all? No, oh, no, not seen. Not seen. So, but huh? we are only seeing the folder, Guru. Yeah. Can I can I stop sharing and then I'll start sharing again one minute? Yeah, yeah. Please do that. Or you can start the uh, presentation. Whatever is ready. Yeah. Uh, so can you see that now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll make it into slide share. Yeah. Can you see that? Can you see that yeah. now? Yeah, we can see you. Okay. So, it's around 70 year old lady who presented with uh, typical, uh, basically, low back pain radiating to uh, left leg since last two years. Uh, she was walking with the limb, and uh, walking distance was very few, uh, few steps only. And she had to take uh, intermittent rest. And the symptoms were progressive. The walking distance was progressively was going down and uh, she was not responding to conservative treatment. And she had all the basically comorbidities. She had a lot of um, previous surgeries and she had a peritonitis because of perforation and hypothyroidism and the right femur fracture, which was managed conservatively. So basically comorbid lady with uh, typical uh, lumbar canal stenosis symptoms with radiculopathy and claudication. And uh, her uh, Neurological examination, uh, left EHL was 3 by 5. Others were almost uh, normal and uh, sensory was intact. So that's the X-ray. So we can see that uh, there is a grade 1 sort of listesis at uh, L5-S1. And uh, that's the listesis. And uh, that's dynamic X-rays we can see that it is unstable. Now, at this stage, anybody wants to comment anything on this? Yes, Mayur. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Uh, this is a grade 1 lytic lysis at L5-S1, and it is definitely unstable, progressing from grade 1 to grade 2 uh, when you flex the spine. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, can you can you uh, see something unusual here, uh, or you think it's a normal uh, LCS pattern? I'll just go back. Sorry, I think I revealed it. But then, yeah, you can can you just uh, elaborate more on the X-ray features? Uh, yeah, kind of a there's a, if you look at the L5, the inferior end plate, it doesn't mm -hmm. look straight. It looks kind of scalloped. So there's yeah. probably something going on over there more yes. than the list. I think, yeah. Guru, the most important aspect what we need to notice here is the disc space is totally collapsing when you know it's flexing and opening up when you are extending. Yes. So this is in a, in a very high degree of instability because you know when patient will stand, the disc will collapse and it will lead to further compression plus yes. listhesis. So I think I'm sure you know this patient will be in a miserable kind of a state. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when 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 you basically uh, let's go to the images and then we'll discuss. Yes. So next investigation, you would like to get a CT, MRI, both. Ideally both. Ideally both. Yes. Yeah. So that's the MRI. So uh, Mayur was right. Uh, the interior end plate and some part of the body was scalloped there, and you can see that there is a basically kind of an instability fluid in the disc. 
so that is what which neeraj was mentioning it was collapsing in the flexion and opening up in the extension uh, so that's that's how it looks and uh, that's again mri you for you go back to the x ray once again yes sir now look at the l45 as well <clears throat> yeah see what's happening to it in flexion and extension there's a posterior small osteophyte but from what i can see on my uh, screen there is a 4 5 reduction in, in height and flexion yes there is some angular instability there also yeah okay well well, well noticed sir yeah so that's how it looked and that that's what is the at l5 s1 disc level and then again you see that so uh, in in such kind of a image uh, of vivek do yes, do you expect something uh, surprising there you you do you think if we start preparing for a surgery or something do you expect it to go normally or do you, are you expecting some challenges there i think first of all we need to see this hyper intensity are we are we dealing with any infection is what we need to see okay uh, i think we need to get a basic blood markers see are we dealing with anything else mm -hmm. and uh, uh, if if infection is ruled out then i think it should be a straight forward l5 s1 t lift if uh, things are fine so you think it's a basically infection has to be ruled out and otherwise mm -hmm. it's a straight forward t lift neeraj yeah Nira, yeah. what do you, do? Do you have any? Do you you think any challenges when you start? Well, I, I I have a few concerns here. First yeah. and foremost is uh, I would definitely would want to check at the CT scan, looking at the pedicle, because you know I mean looks pedicle might be very thin in supra inferior yeah. aspect. That is one. Second, mm -hmm. uh, I think you know I mean the way you see the inferior end plate of L5 is scalloped by the instability. Sometimes mm -hmm. if you don't put your cage properly, your Uh, you don't open the disc space properly your cage will not sit quite anterior as you would want and these yeah. are the cases where you know if you have not done proper fixation the cage would back out immediately so this is a very critical case where you have to position your cage absolutely perfectly otherwise you will end up having you know cage back outs in this kind of cases great point neeraj great point uh, shailesh yeah. uh, your thoughts on it no i agree you know ki oh, um, absolutely we should uh, investigate thorough before we think anything blood parameters are important for me at this stage for sure okay and do you think the cage is going to subside with this picture yeah yeah it is a possibility yeah. it is a possibility so uh, more so so more to... on the l5 well, more on I, the l5 i think i i will i will defer here guru you know i mean because you know this kind of cases more often than not you find a very sclerosed end plate sclerosed end plate yeah so i think you know the, if if you if you take care while preparing you know these are the cases where very less chance that page, uh, cage actually will go into a, a sub uh, chondral bones Okay, uh, Doctor Ajay, Doctor Joshi, uh, your thoughts on this, sir? Agree about investigation. Index of suspicion for infection is low, but um, I think for protocol purposes, worth um, doing. Um, consider bone density. Seventy-year-old uh, uh, concern. History of fracture. Consider pelvic fixation for backup support. Two points of fixation distally. Um, the goals are obviously reduction. not obviously reduction i'm sorry the goals are decompression to afford leg pain relief and strength improvement um important conversation with her i know the the nerve monitoring may differ from setting to setting but that would be a helpful intraoperative adjunct um and then fixation up to l4 probably because that level has some element of instability and as was mentioned the pedicles at l5 may be very challenging to instrument yeah okay so we we are we sir dr raghav sir yeah you know what the in a 70 year old lady right with a l5 s1 instability with a fluid there right as was mentioned <clears throat> we all need to do the blood markers there's no doubt about it but instead of doing a plain ct it's always good to do an f18 that would give you the advantages of a ct as well as any presence of infection that will rule out once and for all because the earliest indication in our own population uh, base is this enhancement whenever you see at this enhancement we think of infection in this country so i would do an f18 instead of doing a uh, just a plain ct that after an mr number 1 blood works bmd this is all part of the game i would certainly look at l45 more closely because any surgery that we do cage or no cage we need to address the instability once and for all both at l45 and 5s1 
So clinical examination, if the five root is involved, etc., is also very important in this situation. So that we don't need to do more surgeries in future. Okay. So we, we all had, uh, actually we had all these things in our mind and we did blood parameters. They were all normal. And then uh, we went ahead and uh, did a CT scan. So uh, that's L4 for you. And that's L5. So you can see on the right side, the pedicle actually has, like it, it's been cored up there and the pedicle is very, very thin. And uh, superior inferiorly also, they were like five, five mm pedicles but then we could manage there. But then right side, if you see more than a super uh, height of the pedicle, the width of the pedicle was basically, it was eroded and it was very, very thin there. So this was very important. If you don't do a CT here, you will definitely end up injuring the root there. So CT plays very, very important role and you have to study both your sagittal images and axial images very carefully because with long standing instability that's instability like this basically a grossly unstable uh, spine there will be some anatomical changes structural changes so that's l5 for you that's again s1 so what is what is the plan now uh, we we have our blood parameters are normal and uh, we have this in front of us uh, with a grade 2 to grade 1 listesis uh, with uh, basically a right side pedicle being very narrow uh, yes, so what Pradeep. Is that? So, so I might. Sorry. Yes, yes, Ajay. Yeah, you can talk. Yes. Well, I I think the uh, the plan in my hands would be to have a discussion with her about going from L four to the sacrum, and I would add that um, pelvic fixation, you know, based on a bone density, I would not um, hesitate. Uh, S2 Ehler iliac technique, at least on one side, would be uh, add, you know, no additional exposure, but also give the confidence that we're not going to have implant failure or sacral failure, which can be devastating. Um, okay. Thorough decompression, I would get the reduction that I could get on the table easily. And I think that's somewhat reproduced by the supine MRI, supine investigations. Um, and that's pretty reasonable. Um, spondylolisthesis screws are help very helpful, um, you know, at L5. And again, if only a unilateral L5 screw can be placed, then the discectomy might allow some tensioning of the ALL, PLL, and a nice, uh, you know, the reduction that's reasonable for someone this age. Yes, Kunal. Yes, sir. Uh, one more comment on this. Uh, basically, the plan is to do uh, to do a T lift. So, uh, deciding to do a banana cage or a cage or a, a bullet cage, depending on the shape of the end plates, that might be important. Like putting a snugly fitting cage in case that there is a loosening. So, larger size banana cage would be, uh, be helpful. Mayur, will you consider anterior surgery here? Yeah, my personal preference uh, for this patient when we have a two level uh, fusion at a hand, I would, uh, I would go more in for anterior. Uh, a lift two levels and percutaneous screws L4 to S1. I would not cannulate the right L5 pedicle. It's too thin. Uh, it's too much of a risk to injure the nerve root at that level. Yes, Neeraj, what do you feel about this? So, Mayur, one minute, Shalish. Mayur, you will do it from L4 to S1, right? Yes, yes. You are not going to do a pelvic fixation? No. no. Okay, Neeraj. No. Well, uh, I think I agree. In my hands, I am not very comfortable with a leaf as on now. So I think if I am comfortable, I'll go for interior. Definitely, you know, this is most ideal case to go for interior. But as on now, I think you know my uh, uh, opinion would be L four to S two. L four to S two. That is, you know, pelvic fixation. I will definitely add a pelvic fixation to this. Okay. Case. Okay. I think Raghavendra has not spoken. Yes, Raghavendra. Yes. I will I will go from L4 to S1, two levels. L4 to and S1. this is a this is a line check list to say. So it will be interesting to see what is happening to the root on uh, on maybe the right side. Okay. Yes, Guru Raj. Uh, Pradeep. Yeah. So it's already been discussed. L4 I think should be upper limit uh, as well as depending on the level of osteoporosis we can involve uh, the testi joint. Okay. So technically, we should be, you know, perfect, you know. Make the 
will make the difference. So what we did is this. Uh, we went from L4 to S1 and uh, got a purchase of a basically uh, a screw on the uh, uh, right side and um, we, sorry that was a left left pedicle which was thin so we could put a right side pedicle and uh, we also found actually this pedicle was eroded by a kind of a, a mass in the L5 nerve root on the left side the L5 nerve root on the left side at the ganglion area was very big uh, it was like a, a tumor in the nerve root there. Uh, so we just took a, some uh, biopsy from the nerve root mm -hmm. and uh, we just ended up doing this. So that's immediately post-op. Any comments on this? We got complete reduction. We got complete yes. perfect reduction. Yes, Rago, sir. You know, reduction is least important in these situations. You know, this is a 70-year-old lady, right? So we reduce as much as we can and the rigid fixation with cages in the front is quite okay. I would have tried a four millimeter screw on the left side and I think I'm very confident I can uh, get into the body through the pedicle. But if you, if you can't, then this fix fixation is more than sufficient. I don't think it is prudent to get into the ileum and go into S2 iliac fixations because a lot of them fail in, in our patient population. Uh, so we need to be very careful getting into ileum. As far as possible, it's better to avoid. The problem is at L5-S1 and slightly at L4-5. So fixing them, and I would really appreciate the use of a crosslink here that would enhance the stability of the fixation. Maybe, you know, some people use BMP to make sure it all fuses, but it's uh, not, in, not favored as much these days because of obvious reasons. So I'm very happy with this fixation. No problem. So, so, Dr. Raghav, you said about BMP. I would like to ask Dr. Joshi. Dr. Joshi, would you use a BMP in this case, especially when you see that inferior end plate of a L5 is scallop? Do you use a BMP in such situation or uh, you would avoid using BMP there? I wouldn't necessarily avoid it. In our environment where there, there's varying levels of insurance coverage, but largely much more than what you deal with, it's very easy to use BMP. Um, it's obviously a multifactorial consideration for risk factors for fusing or not. I will ask all smokers to stop smoking. There's obviously diabetes and other risks, you know, for not fusing. In this case, I think I would have used BMP. Um, yes, I have a case to show if we get to it of a, a teenager with a um, slippage or a spondylolisthesis and did not use BMP in her. I don't think that would be prudent. Um, this x-ray looks great. A very, uh, congratulate you. That's a good um, outcome clinically as well, hopefully, also. Dr. Joshi, are you worried about this scalloped inferior end plate of uh, L5? Because where, somewhere the cancellous bone might have been exposed there. Are you worried about osteolysis when you use a BMP there? No, I think that it's scalloped from erosion, but there's, uh, there's some degree of sclerosis probably on the CT. I don't remember what your CT looked like. I think the challenge there might be just getting to good biology um, you know, there's some cystic changes and uh, S1 has some hardness to it. So, no, I don't think there'd be erosion. I mean, I can't predict which cases with BMP have erosion and which don't, but uh, I think it'd be reasonable to use there. And the only other technical comment I'd make just for anyone that's, you know, these don't come up super often, but uh, carefully uh, osteotomizing the back of the sacrum to allow that inner body access, it can often be a restriction. Um, but great job. So, yeah. I think, uh, so we did this. We were very happy. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, we have Vivek. Yeah, uh, two things. Do you routinely use a transconnector for all your listes? Uh, number one. Mm -hmm. uh, number two is, did the pre-op MRI pick up the tumor? And is that the reason you took the CT scan? Or do you take a CT scan routinely? No, no, it didn't pick up the tumor. But CT scan... Actually, wherever we are in doubt, especially like without seeing CT, Neeraj predicted there can be pedicle issues. So like that, whenever you see this highly unstable listesis where there is an angular instability with translational instability, especially scalloping or a trapezoidal L5, it is always better to take a CT and read your CT properly for anatomy of the pedicles, angles of the pedicles. I will show you one of the my cases. 
the angulation was impossible you can actually combine them with the l4 to s1 screws so you have to uh, study your pedicle uh, basically height width and the angulation and sometimes you can have a basically uh, basically clover leaf canals especially in s1 in this kind of situations so your screw in s1 if you medialize too much you can injure the roots again so it's always better to get your ct done regarding your cross link i would use a cross link here because there is no uh, basically uh, l5 screw on the left side so the rod is going directly from l4 to s1 mm -hmm. so i would want a more stronger construct if i would have had a good purchase maybe in the left side pedicle also i wouldn't have used cross connector but then because is this case we couldn't have a pedicle in the left side we had to use the cross connector okay yes guru raj please yeah, so so we we were happy this is two months uh, follow up even though she continued to have some uh, left sided radiculopathy but she was better than before her walking distance increased and uh, this is two months follow up and then at four months uh, at this basically uh, of index procedure we had to give a left sided root block because it was interfering with her daily routine activities and then again that time we could see that she is also complaining of right sided radiculopathy now and uh, the left sided neurology remained same so this was again because uh, usually we all know that lumbar fixations they do complain with the si joint problems and invariably you press on the si joint they have tenderness so we did give a right sided l5 nerve root block with right sided si joint infiltration at the four months and then this is at four month follow up can you see something uh, unusual or it is good enough or it is going well i think uh, your listes is at l5 s1 is progressing uh, anybody anybody would agree with that and uh, yeah, yeah go ahead go ahead yeah yeah is yeah. loosening of the five screw well i, I think, think uh, there is some loosening of the l1 just show us the previous x ray what was the biopsy report sir biopsy report uh, uh, actually it was nothing significant sir. Okay. actually I, that's why i have not put here so this is the immediate post op Okay. Okay. Something is confused, I think. Uh, and uh, this is now at four months. S one screws. S one screws seem to be loose. I think it's it's just I think touching the end plate or maybe you know. And if okay. there is some hello around, so I mean probably you know it's not no, nice. really there is you know it's a different view perhaps but. Uh, yeah. So I, all we can see is the S1 screw going up a little bit. Yeah. So we we had our doubts. We did study uh, the immediate post op and uh, these X rays very carefully, and we did actually uh, compare the relationship between the cage and the tip of the screw. Uh, mm -hmm. I went mean, relationship of the end plate with the screw, basically because it, it can differ from the angle from where the basically gantry was positioned, where the plate was positioned. So. Uh, it it is very difficult to say whether these screws are loose right now uh, so we 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 sent her back just by giving her root block and si joint block and uh, at 18 months so now it was radiating again she had a radiating pain down the right leg which was initially left leg now she had a radiating pain down the right leg at 18 months and it was going on since 4 months so The, again, the right-sided EHL was weak now. Left-sided had improved. So now this is the X-ray. So now, is there anything abnormal there? A lot more reactive bone at the uh, promontory or anterior sacrum, and uh, not necessarily an obvious halo. But you wonder. You're certainly having some. Anterior migration of L5. It'd be nice to see what a CT scan shows. Okay. Is there Anybody a picture else? of the promontory as well? I'm not sure on these images here on my computer. Yes, sir. Is there any breakage of the L5 
you can't see my screen okay so we we will we'll take your comment sir uh, pradeep do you, yeah. what do you see i think sacral promontory is fractured or discontinuity i could see here sir yeah yeah, yeah. great great uh, so that's yeah. what was happening basically there was a fracture at the mm -hmm. basically uh, sacral promontory level you can see that the cage along with the bone is dipping basically the angle has changed there yeah uh, so what what do you want to do at this stage certainly a ct would help now and uh, certainly a, a repeat of the blood parameters the cr yeah. and the sr okay uh, so it can compare with the previous ones and also if there is any infection indolent anybody else I what agree. Uh, so CT and blood parameters at this point of time. Yeah. What was her BMD, Gurraj, before surgery? Sir, actually, it was minus two. It was not even minus two point less than minus two point five. It was osteopenic range. Femoral neck. Uh, yeah. all the three sides, sir. Right. Wrist and uh, neck and uh, uh, actually spine. Okay. So, so this is her flexion extension X-rays. You can see that that fragment is moving. Mm -hmm. uh, the sacral promontory fragment. It's yeah. moving now, right? And there's already a listhesis over here at L5 S1. Yeah. Then L5 listhesis has progressed. Progressed. Basically, what happened with there is a fusion between the L5 end plate and that fractured promontory, hmm. and L5 is moving along with it now. So wow. if you see that L5 has moved along with the cage, hmm. along with the this fractured fragment. Yeah. Yeah. so that that was a situation this is a mri that time there is no sign of infection and um, so that is what is you can see uh, sorry so now what what do you do shall i wait gurraj for others to speak i have no you can you can sir please please proceed so okay. I, i you know i have a x ray like this uh, slightly different Mm -hmm. I would have shown in my, if I can show my screen later on. Obviously, this is a situation where I can't do much from behind, other than removing the implants. This is what I would do because I know now for sure all these screws will be loose, right? In spite of a good fixation. So we will not talk about terifrax and all that. That's part of our routine treatments that we do: proteins, calcium, terifrax, all these things. So I would remove these implants from behind. Behind. i would turn over the patient and i would do an anterior surgery now and i have uh, done it now about almost i think if i remember about three times i got one x ray to show later on and i've been very successful in doing that mm -hmm. the problem is obviously what do we do for s1 to fix from the front that's a great challenge so that's what i would do because i need it's not easy to remove these cages from behind that too far forward too far yes. forward yes. you can't hold them you can't get a hold on them if you are trying to remove them the first thing you do is you have to compress on the opposite side because just the fragment is fractured if you don't compress on the opposite side and you try to fiddle the cage will go into the tummy believe me especially when there is a tissue that is not very good or the ligaments are all stretched out and uh, not tight as it happens in this uh, Uh, the elderly population and most of the infections, for example, there is uh, almost like a necrotic tissue there. So anyone who is attempting that for the youngsters who are listening to this, you need to compress on one side so that the cage doesn't slip out till you have a very good hold on the cage, and then you release the compression and then you pull the cage out if you can. Four five not too not difficult, but five s one is too difficult, not easy. from behind you can try if you are lucky nothing like it uh neeraj yeah yeah so what i think you know uh, my, my plan would be still uh, from the back side i you know i'm as i said i'm not a very proficient surgeon for elif so i think you know i'll still go for uh, back uh, i'll go try to remove whatever loose implant i'll now involve uh, even s2 pedicle or s3 pedicle or s2 i depending on morphology 
uh, I might consider kind of a delta fixation if possible to you know fix the promontory or a fragment because as you said that it is fused with L5. So there is one possibility. I might have to extend the fusion above uh, depending on the proximal screws whether they are loose or not. Niraj, who spoke? Can I intervene? Yes. yes, sir. Can you, uh, um, Gurraj, can you show us the posterior aspect of the cage of L5S1? Here. There you are. It's almost in front of Sekram now. Yes. Am I right? Yes, sir. I, I, you know, because I'm seeing on this. Right. How easy is it to hold it from behind is the question. So it will be, it will be very difficult, sir. But I think uh, I still... What's the strategy if you can't take it out from behind? I think, sir, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, it should be possible to take out. We might have to osteotomize, you know, a little bit of dome of sacrum to reduce it. The way we do in a spondyloptosis or a grade 4 spondylolisthesis. Yeah. I'm not too sure because I agree with what you're saying. You know, you should try from behind. That would make our life easy. There's no doubt about it. But what I'm seeing is it's right in front of the promontory of the sacrum, right? And... You know, yeah. if what I'm seeing is should be corroborated by Gurraj because obviously he's got in the X-rays. You can see the pin mark here. Yes. Do osteotomy, it would lead you to the mid L5. Yeah. Would it take us to the front of the sacrum. That's my question. Others, I would I would wait for others to comment actually. Okay. So maybe Doctor. Right. Yeah. Yes, Guru. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I was I wanted a comment from Dr. Joshi. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the, the little glitch in the connectivity. So, you know, very challenging problem. And I pre I appreciate your um, putting this forward because I think there's a lot of ways to learn, and that's obviously the objective for all of us. And so, you know, the the dilemma here. I don't think it's a simple back versus front. I think that in an ideal world. You would go to the back, you would remove the rods, you would potentially remove those S1 screws, and then you'd go to the front for a staged anterior. But you told us in the history there was rectal surgery and peritonitis. And so this is going to be very, very uh, challenging, probably. So, you know, the um, yet that's what I would argue in an ideal world gets you to the front to either uh, osteotomize the bottom of L5 and just get the cage out. You can see from the projection that that's really at the level of the pubic symphysis um, or lower. So that's not a trivial way. You know, it's not a trivial uh, goal in the front. I would then go back to the back. So it's probably this revision is a back front and back is the way I conceptualize it. I'll tell you my disclosures that I've done my share of anterior surgery, but not to do complex spondylolisthesis reduction. So my experience is limited, but I've done lots of um, staged deformity surgery. And I, I think it would need something like that. Um, the other thing I want to say real quickly is that we also learn that there are, there are risks with anything we do. So the pelvic fixation for me would have been erring on that side from the get-go thinking, hey, now I'm going to sleep better that in the immediate post-op or later on, there's just some belt and suspenders, if you will, for not having a failure. And um, the final point I would make just is that, you know, we have studied diabetic Hispanics. We have a large, you know, um, uh, Latino population in South Texas, and you can have bone fragility at normal T scores. And similarly, a negative two is not terrible, but negative two with a femur fracture, I think we should think that you are officially osteoporotic. And um, so, you know, they teach you that you should have a certain negative uh, certain incidents of negative instances of exploration for, for appendicitis, just to use an example from another field. And that's a, you know, acceptable rate because you're trying to catch the real ones. Well, maybe there's a certain element of unnecessary quote unquote pelvic fixation, but um, you would never know. But if it saves you from the problems, you know, kyphosis after a sacral fracture is a terrible problem. So just these are some takeaways that I think are reasonable. Bone density, pelvic fixation. Uh, so Yes, Guru, I think we will have to proceed yeah. because we are yeah. really running short of time and a yeah, lot so, of presentations. Yeah, please. Yeah, so yeah. Points, points well taken. Basically, basic is she had a, an abdominal surgeries. So we, we expected the anterior surgery is going to be difficult. So what we did is this. You can see that we could reduce that uh, listesis again back to almost like a grade three or so and then the cage also came back with it 
uh, basic because it was fused with the L5 inferior end plate. And uh, I did, we did put a S2 AI on one side and then S1 AI and S2 AI on another side. So any comments here? Quick comment and then we'll proceed. <laughs> reduction maneuver in this. Uh, basically, uh, when we when we uh, took away the basically the S1 screws and then we extended our uh, hips and then L5 screw was luckily was holding very well. So we could actually uh, give some traction on the L5 pedicle screw also and then pull it back. Basically, it was both by extension of the hip and then uh, some traction on the L4 and L5 screws. Very well done, very well done, Guru. And we need to closely follow up. With this one minute, it didn't finish there. I'll just rush through this. Yes. So, so this is what we did. And we started around teriparatide now for secondarily for the fusion also. So this is what started happening. This is two months. This is that one year follow up. Both basically S1AI and S2AI screws on the left side, they became loose. And the rod on the right side from S2 AI came out. Mm. Yeah, so my question, my, my question, by, you know, in previous case was that only that, you know, I mean, uh, considering kind of instability we had even with the previous primary surgery, would you be okay with, you know, only probably, you know, three point fixation distally? Because, you know, I might have want to put more, you know, I'm not sure, you know, I mean, two, either side, two S2 AI, two, four screws, eight, at least, you know, I would want eight point fixation distally. But then, Neeraj, if you see the failure here was basically the fracture. How many patients do we see kind of fracture? Yeah, this is this is a very challenging case. You know, I this is probably you know I mean a worst case we can see. You know. So now uh, I'll rush through. What happened is with teriparatide and all that, whatever the fractured fragment or that also got united a uh, little bit with the basically S1. And uh, what we did next was you can see this uh, that uh, the L5 pedicles. This there is a loosening here in the screws here. And uh, again, this is the neurology. And this is, for, they just went away. They didn't wanted any more intervention, but then pain increased. They had to come back. This is the MRI. You can see that. And uh, this is a CT. Uh, you can see that there is a complete fusion at L4, L5. It's solidly fused. And there is a fusion between that mass and then L5. So right now, what we did is we just basically took away uh, 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 the screws from the S2 AI, all the S1 AI screws, and then put the iliac screw. And then this time we did use this, basically a delta fixation kind of a screw into the S1 pedicles, which were formed by this time with actually, again, they, are, they were formed because of the teriparatide and uh, uh, healing process. So we could uh, negotiate uh, one screw which can go from S1 to L5 and then one another screw into the S1 pedicle. This S2 AI screw was uh, intact. We could again put back the rod into it and use the another iliac screw and connect it with that. So right now, six months post-op, 10 months post-op. So right now, this is the situation. Any quick comments? Otherwise, that's the end. Yeah. Sure. Heroic surgery. Well done. Well done, Guru. And I would like uh, to compliment you and your team to be patient. And, uh, you know, because there is a level above the level in spine. And that is the challenge in lumbar spine, which is one of the most mobile of all the zones. I would like to compliment you, Guru. And uh, if you can run through your next case as a rapid fire, and then we proceed with Dr. Okay. Raghavendra's presentation. Okay. 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 So how do I go back? One minute. I'll just... Uh rush through one more one of our panel members is relaxing in goa i think oh. <laughs> <laughs> just having a feel of lockdown <laughs> Yeah, that's one more case. Yeah, uh, quick now, two minutes, uh, because we have uh, seven yeah. presentations here. Yeah. Yeah. So that's again history, low back pain, six years, radiating uh, down uh, both lower limbs, right more than left. Walking distance was less than 100 meters. It was progressive, uh, no motor or sensory deficits. 
and uh, was not responding to conservative treatment. That's again a similar kind of a case. Uh, so that's again a L5S1 lytic uh, listasis. But if you see here, uh, the L5 was totally decapitated. You, you need to open your presentation. Yeah, it's uh, presentation is not seen. Need to open, yeah, please. I have opened it. Maybe. Maybe you will have to again cl close screen sharing and reconnect it. You know, probably okay. last time. Okay. Okay. Can you see it now? Not yet. Your screen sharing is paused. Who has paused the screen sharing? It's saying your screen sharing has been paused. Okay, we'll go with uh, Raghavendra. Can you please share your screen? Guru, we'll take your case later. We'll uh, proceed okay. with in the meantime, in case okay. there is a okay. delay here. No problem. Yes, Raghavendra. You need to enlarge. And uh, this is a presentation because as it is instability, we all will just go through, just refresh ourselves most of uh, us are uh, knowing this, we have read this, but you know, it is always better to refresh when we talk about lumbar instability and pelvic parameters. At times we keep forgetting about all this and this is for uh, for all uh, all of us and our uh, juniors and fellows as well. Thank you. Thank you, Raghu. Yes, Raghavendra. No, no, we cannot hear you. You can remove that. You can just remove that earphone and directly you can speak to the laptop. That's better. And I just detach it, I think. Detach from the laptop. Yeah. Raghavendra? No, you can detach your earphone from the laptop. Yeah. Directly you can speak. Some issue? Some issue with Raghavendra? I think he might have to join back again. Uh, can join back again. Uh, is Ajay ready with your presentation, Ajay? I am, yes. Yeah. Uh, Raghavendra, you can just uh, stop sharing your screen. We'll ask uh, Ajay to present and then we uh, come back to you. All right. So this is uh, just two cases and some some... Uh, concepts that accompany. Um, you can see that my screen, you can see case one. Yes. Yes. Okay. So a uh, basketball player uh, that I met, a uh, 14 year old female um, who has progressive back pain um, and gait change, some tight hamstrings, no real other neurology, uh, bowel or bladder or anything like that, but progressive discomfort. Um, a dysplastic type spondy. You can see the facet joints. You can see the slippage. Um, and I think it's notable that, you know, given sagittal parameters, there's probably some overload at upper, more normal levels. Um, and it's debatable if you were going to do something, whether you would do something at L4-5. You can see the canal is quite tight there. So she had been through a lot of conservative care, injections, therapy, activity modification, and um, her, she, her parents elected that she get this fixed. Interestingly, because they're harboring notions that she can go on to play, you know, uh, college athletics and whatnot, a big, you know, big deal to get a scholarship, etc. So uh, that's not necessarily why I offered surgery, but um, did surgery uh, L5 S1 only, um, a thorough decompression to get the L5 nerve roots, some reduction that was more postural, but also after the inner body clean out discectomy. Um, and then this one level fixation. And uh, she uh, was very happy, no symptoms. She's working out and playing high school varsity basketball and has an interest in playing in college. So I think that just slip angle and translational correction were helpful, I would think, to unload L4, 5 and above. Um, I think that the traditional notion of two points of fixation, either one above and one below, which I would call the trolley concept and then lifting L5 back or two points distal, which is uh, S1 and S2, 
those maybe we don't need to do, especially if we're not going to leave screws in L4. So the concept here was putting the screw in at, L at S1 and tightening it temporarily so it was not reduced at L5 and then tightening the screw down, the set screw at L5 to lift uh, L5 backwards and then putting in your cages. So bilateral inner body support, uh, reduction screws used at L5, but no instrumentation even temporarily at L4. Um, and then uh, she's gone on to do very well so far. Questions or thoughts, or should I just cover another one? I, I don't mean to take too much time, but. Can just going. go back to that image, the previous image? Yes. Now, is there a problem at L4-5 that I'm seeing on the x-ray? Uh, there might be. I think she's at some risk to develop a problem. It might become hypermobile. I mean, I don't see an immediate problem. And clinically, there's no problem in terms of uh, she feels good and she's tolerating a high level uh, demanding um, load on her back. But I don't see frank listhesis or, uh, you know, instability on flexion extension. Yeah, because I could see that there is a small slippage forwards of five or four over five. Yeah, very subtle, very subtle, we can see. Yeah. I, I, also, think, I also think so, yeah. And, and in the no. MRI, there was a small disc at 4 5 as well. 4 right. 5. Yeah. Certainly. No, they, Absolutely. Disc is okay, slight degeneration, but I don't know what the flexion extension views are in the pre op uh, before surgery, the pre op images. Yeah. And this looks like a transitional segment as well. Yeah. See, the, the most times, uh, uh, Ajaya, this is Dr. Raghav from Hyderabad. Uh, you know, I have burnt my fingers on a couple of occasions in these dysplastics. And uh, the, the problem is that we, I, we tend to treat this as a listhesis. And uh, we think of slip angles and all that. But today, I would think more in terms of kyphosis. And if it is a kyphosis elsewhere, we would go up and down. That's what we do. We don't just fix the kyphosis. So I've changed my uh, practice in recent times, and I just don't limit myself to 5S1 in dysplastics. I'm not talking about talking about lytic listhesis. Dysplastics are a different ball game, and they are known to fail. So I would go a level up. See, even on the MR, I mean, MR obviously is not the right one to, uh, to decide, but we need a slightly longer fixation in dysplastic kyphotics especially in children like these who are high performance athletes the, the other other factor to notice here is sir uh, basically uh, there's a very high pelvic incidence exactly. uh, with with the shear kind of a forces a lot of shear forces acting there so i would also agree that maybe uh, i would i would not say i would do go to l4 straight away but then i would be very careful in doing just l5 s1 here I would perhaps, you know, looking at the post-op x-ray, we don't have the benefit of uh, the pre-op x-rays here. Certainly, I would uh, be very careful. That's a CT. Yeah. Uh, you know, in a, as I said, dysplastics, I'm treating slightly differently nowadays because there's a high failure rate. If we treat dysplastics like, like lytic aesthetics, these are two different thing, uh, categories. And uh, they are well known uh, to cause problems. Yeah, I think we will keep a watch on this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Point well noted, uh, sir. It is always careful and monitoring. But what exactly was done by Ajay also has a rationale, you know, to avoid a level for a young 14. That was also one uh, arguable uh, thing. Uh, I would like uh, Ajay to uh, compliment and can proceed with the next case. Sure, absolutely. And these are a point well taken. I think I did have an extensive preoperative discussion about risks and benefits, two levels versus one. Um, I didn't see frank instability. I do note your point about a slight slippage, but you know, so far clinically uh, holding up well, we'll have to watch. So second is uh, perhaps conceptually about, uh, when we talk about implant failure, now we can talk about some um, axial instability. Um, and there have been waves of things that are done that are inner body spacers. Uh, and these are, you know, uh, regain, which is from EBI in the past, um, uh, satellite, uh, back in the it, decades ago, there was a Fernstrom ball, which is meant to be a ball bearing. And I think just like 
in any technology, what's the best ACL fixation ham or graft choice? What's the rotating knee, uh, rotating platform, total knee versus fixed bearings? I mean, there's waves of things that come through, but this is basically uh, a problem for this lady. So 57 year old smoker, surgery five years before, and this Medtronic satellite device, which you can see with the markers at L34 was placed through a laminectomy uh, approach. They didn't do a destabilizing facetectomy, they just did a laminectomy uh, and she's had significant back pain, failing conservative treatment. Um, you can see end plate changes, subsidence, cystic changes, and MRI has similar findings. So basically, uh, to me, uh, and this is maybe to elaborate in a different setting or now, uh, I use direct lateral a lot. Um, I have the ability to do the trans uh, you know, plexus monitoring with the proprietary monitoring from the Nuvasiv company. But regardless, it's really excellent if you cut anterior longitudinal ligament to restore sagittal balance with hyperlordotic implants. But in this case, the purpose for doing this was minimally invasive, fresh territory to retrieve the device, uh, put in a big bone graft with uh, a big cage, a lot of bone graft in this big cage, and then um, backup fixation was percutaneous uh, posteriorly. So two parts under one anesthesia, she went on to fusion and was very satisfied. Well done, well done. I nice, must nice. compliment. Very good. Well done, Ajay. Anything, Mayur? Yeah, I have a question. How easy or how difficult was it for you to uh, retrieve the previous implant through the X-lip approach? Uh, did you have to go through the SOAS, play, uh, dissect through it, and then retrieve the implant? Can you please yes, elaborate sure. on that? Of course. So standard lateral access is a body wall incision and then uh, dissection into the retroperitoneum and then dilator tubes, which are electrified and circumferentially looking for nerves. So standard approach is just dock uh, and then place a guide wire when there's a satisfactory position, mm -hmm. dilate up to a retractor, open the retractor. Now you're inside the psoas, the nerves are typically running behind you. Uh, you do a lateral annulus uh, incision and then a discectomy. In this case, you know, my standard moves with a cob and a shaver uh, encountered the device that was hard. There's mm -hmm. somewhat of a ship in a bottle phenomenon where the lateral uh, uh, distance between the end plates might be a little smaller than the device, but um, using a combination of a hooking technique and a grasping technique with a pituitary, it did come out relatively uneventfully. Wow. wow. Nice. Fantastic. Fantastic. Any, any one quick Thank comment you. from Pradeep? And how, then we how about using oblique approach? Pull it. Yeah, oblique is uh, very fair. I mean, these are all variations, right? Oblique, you don't have to deal with the, the plexus. You are closer to the uh, to the vessels. Uh, you're more anterolateral, if I understand. Do you mean like the what they call the OLIF for L5S1, O-L-I-F, where you're um, more anterior? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that, you know, I don't routinely do anterior surgery anymore. Um, I would obviously involve a vascular surgeon to do that. I think um, that depends on your skill set. That's a very valid way to get there too. These are sort of less invasive, well-tolerated approaches. Well done, Ajay. I must compliment you for this Fantastic. challenging one. Uh, and we would like uh, to check with Raghavendra whether his uh, presentation is ready to upload and let's try once again. Raghavendra too. Yes, you can stop sharing, uh, Ajay. And these are always challenging uh, uh, cases. There are uh, different ways to skin a cat. And, uh, you know, that I was uh, talking earlier that everyone is right in this context. Everyone has different experience. Most of them will prefer posterior because they are used to it. But these are some challenging cases where we need to use the anterior as well. Yes, Raghavendra, over to you. Hear you. We can't hear you, Raghavendra. You should unmute his microphone first. He, he, he is unmuted, actually. And uh, don't don't use your, your earphones. Just avoid that earplugs, Raghavendra. Stop them. Stop them. Just take it out from the laptop. Directly, you can just speak to the computer. We cannot hear you yet. Because till now it was on.
basically when it prompts use computer audio you should use use computer audio dr vijlani can you help him out is he there so shailesh can we take somebody else's case now shailesh unmute yourself dr raghav sir cases will take raghav sir are you ready i am ready i had a problem loading my cases my uh, software guy is here okay i'll just see uh, one second now i go on to share raghavendra we cannot see your your presentation here okay sir we can see your screen raghav sir you can see my screen yeah yeah okay, can you see this now okay. yeah, yeah we can see your Perfect. case yeah. okay now i'll do one thing you can see my screen yes sir let's go to a third case which would be a little bit like there you are right i'll go for this right this is a very old case done quite a long time ago more than 10 12 years ago this is a 62 year old lady can you see all of you because i had some problem loading yes yes we can yes. see all can right see. um and uh, this is sorry okay yeah they can see so let's leave it at that now low back pain no claudication was walking 2 kilometers every day and uh, this is her case as you can see this is about 10 years old now i'm sorry for the poor quality x ray this is listhesis here of l4 over l5 can you see my cursor yes, yes sir okay you have to trust what i'm telling you now that's the listhesis there and this was what was done Okay. Steffi, yeah. This was Steffi. This was 2010. And can somebody point out what's happening here apart from the instrumentation? I think is there a lytic list uh, lysis at L34? Yeah, that was created. That's an iatrogenic listhesis that is created now. Okay. The screw screw seems to be okay. Well, yes. Neeraj. Neeraj, bye. या या बोलो बोलो सर सर टू टू थिंग्स see the implants now after a few a month later yeah mm -hmm. that's the picture now and as you can see uh, there's a problem here at l3 level and this is all collapsed and obviously there's a big failure of implants so i did what i had to do i just went in and removed the implants as you can make out there was a huge uh, metal reaction to the whole thing there was a lot of dirty brownish fluid and material and uh, i suspected that there could be a low grade infection because pre op her crp was elevated though she was apyrexial so now anyhow so we removed the screws and there were big big holes in l4 and l5 and the pedicles were completely cut out at l5 level you could feel the soft tissues fortunately there was uh, no uh, significant weakness of her legs so that's her ct and you can see now the implants the screw here is completely outside in the root canal if you can see below the pedicle yeah yeah right so this is where you know this is what i did so i went anterior i just uh, uh, you know these are good old days of course we would do different cages and all that we have lordotic cages and all these things available but those days i did harms cage right Yeah. and the 451 if you can see i jammed it in a slightly uh, lordotic situation there yeah. with the hope it's only a hope that uh, 
it would stay that way. Fortunately, it stayed that way. So I cut off a bit of the back side of the cage and I preserved the end plates and I banged it in from the front and used autograph to fill up the cages. Okay. And I could get a good lordosis here, as you can see here. Yeah. I don't have all those images that we would do today, but uh, you see this is all completely anterior. So I removed all the implants. There was no way uh, I could have held it without going into uh, the sacrum and ileum and all that. So in elderly population, I've tried to avoid uh, putting screws into the ileum as far as possible. And believe me, this lady, I've followed her up. I don't have the post-op x-rays now today. And uh, she's now 10 years follow-up. She actually came about six months ago and we took some x-rays and it's solidly fused and she's doing very, very well. And I thought that there's a bit of retro on the top, but today she's still, that disc space is maintained and she has no problem now. It's totally asymptomatic, yeah. barring the low back pain that they would get anyhow, little yeah. bit of low back pain. Very, very well done, sir. Wow. Uh, if you, as you said, rightly said, they are the challenging cases. The minute we see the x-ray, we see some amount of retro, but that's that's the degenerative, nothing to worry at times. Maybe 2 to 4% or 5% patients will have trouble in uh, long follow-ups. We need to be careful when we follow up these cases. Now there we have a 10-year follow-up and she's fine. Absolutely, absolutely. I'll just yes. go to the first case now. Yes, sir. Okay, and stop me whenever you want to. Now, this is an interesting case. Uh, this is uh, very special uh, to Ajaya, uh, to India, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is a 51-year-old man, smoked like hell, 20 to 30 cigarettes a day. He's been an insulin-dependent insulin diabetic, uncontrolled diabetes. He came to us with sugars around 400, and he had... Uh, dem demonstrable diabetic neuropathy. Now, this gentleman went, uh, uh, you know, to some surgeon and this was what was done. So, his diabetic neuropathy was going on. It, this was an x-ray done five years ago. Now, sorry, five years before he came to me. Again, these are all old patients I'm showing. So, the quality of imaging is not suboptimal. You must uh, bear with me. Now, I put an arrow there and an arrow here. That is because this is the extent of a laminectomy that was done for this gentleman. Oh. Can you see? Yeah, 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 we can. Right. Now, don't ask me why that was done. I have no clue. <laughs> and uh, this guy came to me and uh, we repeated his, uh, what you call the nerve convection studies and we had extensive EMGs with the help of a very good neurophysician. And uh, we told him to smoke in the promptly said that I'll stop from today, which he didn't do even till today. This is more than, I think, about 10 years old uh, surgery. Now, this guy is heavy. And uh, this is a picture. He has severe back pain and sciatica. Now, you can see the picture here. There is... Yeah. 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 Any comments, please, on that? Any quick comments, Pradeep? Kunal. Five, four, three, two. The Bombay guys. There's a retrolysthesis at uh, two, three. two, three. With yes. reduction in the disc space. Yes, well done. Next, Mayur. Actually, I think PARS is absent there. Everything is absent. PARS is gone. <laughs> Look at the laminectomy. D12 to yeah. L5 S1, I think. Yeah. So, but and the pain is getting high. So, I would like to know more in the sense, what was the nature of his back pain? Uh, now, uh, when he came to me? Yes, sir. Basically, to he, 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 did, did he have a rest pain or it was only when he moved or... He, he was having uh, back pain when walking. His, his prodication distance was hardly 50 meters or so. Mm. So he was more complaining of uh, severe backache and uh, left gluteal pain and left sided sciatica. And Much than right side. Did he have a back pain like in uh, shift, changing positions, maybe from lying yeah. up to sitting, sitting? To... And sitting was very painful. Okay. okay. Yeah. So we are sitting at you know the MRI? Constitutional. That's his MRI. That's the T2 sagittal entire. You can see the whole of this muzzle, the bone is removed. Yeah. Yeah. 
A very so, unique surgery whoever has done is very unique surgery. Yeah, because he has got claudication pain. So not all of that, and it's unilateral. So not lot of uh, not all of that is because of his neuropathy. Probably because of the instability. Whenever he is sitting or he is trying to stand up and walk, uh, yeah, his yeah. spine is going into kyphosis, and more of retral distension. That is what is compressing on the nerves. I would like to ask how many of you will do a long segment and how many of you will do only that L two three. One segment. Yes. Guru one Raj. segment for me. I'll one do segment. one segment only. If. Only if one segment, Neeraj. Yeah. Yeah. Pradeep. Only if one segment L two three. Ne Neeraj. Yeah. Only if with posterior fixation or only only. No, no, posterior posterior fixation. Yeah. Or you know, I, you can you can you can even go for a few walks, you know, if possible. In this case, I think there should not be a problem. Are my images clear to you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Kunal. Sir, only posterior uh, L two three will say approach and fixation. One level. Okay. Vivek. Yeah, I also agree with the uh, single level fixation. Yes, Eight. yes, sir. And Ajaya, final master, our master from Texas. Single level fixation L two three. What approach? Um, debatable about uh, direct lateral here has many advantages discussed before. I would uh, optimize him. You could make an argument if we're going to open this up to every single treatment option of saying go away for six months, stop smoking, fix your diabetes, exercise, volunteer, et cetera, get in a brace and um, see how much better you get. As if there's no, I missed the slide, is there a neurologic deficit? If there's not, you could try that. Uh, and if he's not better than uh, direct lateral uh, inner body graft, not because um, it, there's quite a collapsed space to be sure, but to help promote fusion and then posterior percutaneous fixation. Um, there is stenosis there, but that might be a separate um, stage, if you will. Yes, sir. That's the L23. Now let's see what Raghav sir has done. You know, I looked at this as a kyphosis problem, believe me. To me, it was much more kyphosis, localized kyphosis than retrolysthesis. Yeah. A was kyphosis, B is retrolysthesis. C is, of course, the root canal compromise, as you can see here. Yeah. Right? So on the MRIs, they look like big days, but when you go there, it's all fibrous tissue and a little bit of this tissue. Yes. So, to me, I had to address the kyphosis. And to me, there was hardly any bone to fuse. And 10 years ago, this guy is a poor guy, so no question of using BMD, BMP and all that. In more than 10 years, as you can see on the MR. So I did this. See, as I said, I went in from behind. I put, three, I put screws at three levels, one above and below, and into the vertebra. Then I turned him round. And I did an anterior graft fusion, right? And believe me, it's now, as I said, more than 10 years, this thoracic kyphosis and lumbar lordosis is well maintained even till today. This claudication pain is gone. Don't ask me why I didn't put a cage. I should have. I put a graft there and I put anterior screws. So I did two stage procedure. So I cleared the root canal. I removed whatever the fibrous tissue was there, undercut, un undercutting of the root canal because the laminectomy was already done extensive. There was hardly any bone to fuse. The transverse process was very small. So I added some iliac bone there at the back and did whatever postulateral we could do. But I had to turn the patient around and did an anterior and that fused solid and he is doing very well. Today, of course, you know, we could put a we should, I should have put a cage at that time as well. I don't know why I didn't do it. But it, it uh, worked very well. Uh, so ultimately, the result matters. And what you've done is a phenomenal job. Excellent job in a very tough revision and instability, addressing the deformity as well as compression. Oh, well only, done. Yeah. Only my worry would have been uh, the L1, L2 disc. Uh, because there is no fusion there. I would have worried about my L1 screws. Yes. But then he's holding on. That's yes. good. Yeah. I did, as I said, a lot of postulateral fusion with iliac graft. And I have a lot of follow up on this guy. They work, yeah, they work well. Yeah. Postulateral work yeah. better. So far, so good in 10 years now. So far, so good. Perfect. We compliment you like for your excellent job and uh, your team. Uh, would like to go with the next presentation. Uh, I would like uh, 
Dr. Kunal to present his uh, next. Okay. Because we are uh, running short of time. And any, you can comment anything. Anyone wanted to talk a guru or anything? Yeah. Dr. Mayur Kardile here. Yeah. Uh, I would like to really compliment sir for those two fantastic cases that he had shown, especially the first one. Uh, we saw those screws that he has put into the body uh, from left to right. That L5 screw putting that is a very, very challenging job because the left, um, you know, the left common iliac vein is right over there where he has put the screw. Fantastic, phenomenal job. You Thank said you. it, Mayur, and over to Kunal. Uh, yes, Kunal, please proceed. So, can I be seen and heard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, starting with my first case, it's a very short case. Uh, a 55 year old lady operated three months back uh, with my orthopedic colleague presented to me with a persistent back pain and mild tingling numbness in both the legs. The claudication had improved up, up to the surgery and she was walking independently and there was no deficit. And she presented with this kind of an x-ray to me. This was the preoperative x-ray and uh, this was the three-month x-ray when she came to me with persistent back pain and only mild tingling numbness in the, both the legs. Yes, day one impression, uh, Neeraj, day one impression. Sorry? What See, is I, the impression? I, the minute I, you see I, this. So this, this 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 image is how how much after post op period you know this is where it was operated yeah so this is two months after yeah yeah around and pa and patient is only having back pain yeah persistent back pain and mild tingling numbness and how disabling is the back pain uh, it's the same as preoperative back pain well, I guess you know I'll, I'll I'll wait and watch with this you know there is some. Do you want to comment out. anything about the X-ray? Yeah, I think you know there is cage back out. That is one thing. No, no. Uh, immediate post. I think I'll be. So I I have only two X-rays on my screen. One is pre-op, the other one is post-op, which is probably yes, good two, which is two months after, right? Pre yes. Yeah. So you you want me to comment on pre-op? No, 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 no. What the I would say is most of these times, right? <clears throat> you see here. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. The cage, I don't think it has gone as far as forward as it should go. Mm -hmm. You see here, uh, you know, there's already, it's, the cage is coming to the anterior and mid third junction, and there's a slope here. Mm -hmm. And this, it's and on the top of the right? You see here, there's a, the cage is too big for it to go forward. If you look at the immediate post of X-ray, I would really want to see that. We don't have that, unfortunately. You know, a lot of these cages that we do in Indian patients, when we reduce, the cages don't go as far forwards as we would want them. Yeah. It's really yeah. important that we have much yes. smaller cages. I'm not talking about the height, I'm talking about the length of the cage. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, Ajaya, any quick comment? Uh, one comment just in terms of systems. Is, is it true, um, Dr. Kunal, that you're saying that you inherited this patient from your orthopedic colleague who um, did the index surgery, is that accurate? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And your orthopedic surgeon colleague is not spine trained, is that right? Spine trained, correct. Okay. Yeah, that's in an interesting ongoing societal system issue because here in my setting, it's pretty much recognized these days that you need to be spine fellowship trained if you're orthopedic and the neurosurgeons are not necessarily fellowship trained, but um, I think it's harder maybe to regulate um, all of that in your setting. So understood. As far as this implant and the technical aspects, agree that this may represent back out, that maybe this cage was too tall or the shaving that was done was uh, not all the way to the front. So uh, it'd be nice to see two views, but yeah, concerning for a cage back out. Yes, Kunal, please proceed. So would you, you conserve it at this moment of time or would you intervene and do a revision surgery? What I would love to see to answer that question is, is there progression of an implant migration? If there's not, then potentially this has a chance to heal with no neurology. You have a chance to still have a good outcome if the back pain is, you know, muscle and post-operative uh, can respond to post-operative rehabilitation. So if there's relative structural stability, potentially no intervention. Okay. So I conserved this patient with uh, lumbosacral belt and teripoided injections and pain, and pain medicines. And then she came to me at seven months post-surgery with this kind of a picture. Oh. Yes, Pradeep. Yeah. The immediate next plan now. So we need to revise it. How clinically this is now? 
Clinically, she has the disabling back pain and cannot walk without support and uh, both leg pains. We need to plan it, madam. Yeah. We need to revise it now. Okay. Right. So, you what are the revision strategies like the cage, screws, and additional bone graft? No, before that, we need a CT scan and we need to read our CT scan thoroughly here. Hmm. Uh, we cannot just go ahead and uh, uh, get surprised uh, intraoperatively. We need to see how much the L5 pedicles are coded out, how much the S1 pedicles are coded out, whether S1 screws are loose or not, yeah. and whether this where is this cage exactly lying, whether we can take this out or not. So we, we need to ask ourselves a lot of questions before we plan anything. So without a CT scan, going ahead and doing a surgery here is going to be disastrous. I agree with Guru that uh, MRI will tell us any soft tissue and any infection, uh, basic blood workup and C uh, CT scan will definitely tell us any lysis, what exactly is the placement of the uh, cage. Yes, Kunal, please proceed. I don't have the pictures of CT scan. It was done and it was showing L5 through loosening. Okay. okay. S1 screws were okay. S1 screws were okay on CT scan. Yes, what did you do then? So, any revision strategy then? Uh, I revised it uh, with a longer fixation. I went up to L4. I revised the L5 screw with a longer and a larger screws. Uh, looking for the cage was difficult. It was difficult to uh, retrieve the cage. So, I located it with an CM with a pen field and pushed it back and uh, compressed the cage. And this was the final picture which I got. But did you, how did you get the cage back with the pen field? Yeah, so uh, I uh, distracted the L5 S1 space by putting the new screws, which are uh, which were uh, 7.545, like a longer and a la larger screws. And it was difficult to retrieve the cage. So with a Penfield uh, Dura, I located the cage on, on an CM and then pushed it back. Push it back means where? Push it in the front. In the, uh, yeah, in the front. Yeah. The front, yes. Show the top, yeah. Interiorly. Was that very loose? It was loose, yeah. It went very easily. After distraction, it went very easily inside. See, I think what happened with the Penfield is you actually, uh, is that the picture on the right, the la final picture? Yeah. I think the co uh, the, the the cage was, uh, you have rotated it nicely hmm. rather than just pushing it. See, it looks like more an end-on view of the cage, isn't it? Side? Yeah, yeah, side to side. Yeah. View rather than a la lateral yeah. view. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that saved your day, you know. Otherwise, it's not easy to do anything with a pen field. Yeah. Yeah. There, there so, are few problems. So considering the situation, it's a good job. Very but, good job. It was very difficult to find the cage because of the additions and scarring on that side. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And sometimes patients are overweight, bulky, so all these things. Bleeding yeah. inside, all these things can be an issue. Show the last picture, Kuna. Yeah. Five year follow up. Yes, sir. Lovely. Plants are went, uh, holding well and she had includes uh, clinically. I think you address the pathology very well. In case the cage is very, very loose, you can definitely retrieve it, get a good bone graft and uh, put it there with a cage, a new cage you, you might as well, you can use. But in situations where it can be tough and it's not any infective local issue, you can push the case as you rightly done. You extended the level because at times when there is a back out of the screws in L5, it's difficult to get a very good purchase. Even if you use the rescue screw and you try, uh, try to stop at L5, you may land up in trouble. It's better to supplement at times and what I think you've done a good job in this case. Yeah. Uh, we proceed to your next case, Kunal. Quick one minute, yes, yes, now rapid fire and then we'll have to go with Dr. Vincent. Yeah, 48 year old lady with significant back pain since a uh, long time and leg symptoms since six months with no deficit and no uh, diabetes or uh, hypertension. This was the X-ray. Okay, run through, run through now. Ah, so, x ray showing uh, L3 for lateral listesis. Otherwise, there was no uh, listesis on a uh, lateral x ray. On AP, we can see L3 for lateral listesis. And this was the uh, MRI picture. So, discussion will be on levels of fusion and levels of decompression. Yes, one quick comment uh, from Guru. Actually, to give a right answer, you will need more uh, basically uh, pictures. But with available information, I would do a fixation at L3-4 and do a decompression at L4-5. 
So you'll do a one level decompression L34 and you'll do de uh, fixation at 34 and decompression at 45, right? Yeah, yeah. Two level decompression, one level fixation. Anyone, yeah. Raghav, sir? No, no. Let's talk to the minimally invasive guys, right? Yes. <laughs> Yes. Knowledge. Yeah. Can you can you go back to the, your uh, X-ray? We're all screw compression, cage fixation guys. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you know. I mean, I'll agree with Guru. You know, single level should be sufficient for this patient. Yes, Ajay. For minimally invasive. Yes, sir. You know, I mean, always better to go only if you know, don't do anything to only and come back. <laughs> but I think you know there is four five uh, decompression also. So my, I might you know do a posterior decompression in this. Picture. Yes, Ajay, what you will do? I like the one level uh, fixation at three four direct lateral in my hands would work very well. And then posterior, you could do minimally invasive uh, tubular decompression uh, is one strategy three four and four five. Okay, any inputs for open surgery, Pradeep? Posterior, standard, microscopic? Standard, uh, open T-lift can be done or MIS T-lift can, can be done. I would prefer in this case only particularly because okay. Okay. pain is a deformity, we need to correct larger cage or so. Yes, tell us what you did, Kunal, quick. So one only quick comment. So based on the end plate picture at L34, any difficulty in placing cage in only for T-lifts? No, I don't think so because you know Olaf is very forgiving because you will be putting larger cage and you know the surface area will also be quite large. So you know whatever end plate erosions are there, you can very easily mitigate that. It will not uh, be a problem. Pailesh, okay. yes, because this is an instability thing. This case is a very good uh, case where we can actually uh, represent a, a different kind of instability. We Correct. saw the sagittal dis displacements, but this yes. is. In a rotatory instability, it is more, not more of a lateral listesis. Absolutely, it absolutely. It is an instability in axial plane. It is a rotatory instability, basically. Yes, yes, Kunal, quick now because we are running short of time. So we'll do uh, I did a house and I did a single level uh, fusion and L45 for a minute. Yeah, great. Yes, next, please. Yeah, I would like to thank Kunal for a very good job. Uh, is Raghavendra ready with his presentation? We give one last try, Raghavendra. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, yeah, please share your screen then. Yeah, I will do that. As we have, we are running off short, short of time, we'll uh, go a little uh, quick without wasting much time now. Yeah, finally, Raghavendra is. Uh, yeah, can you can you see? Yeah, yeah, we can see the screen and I'm we can. Also. Yeah. Not yet. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry for the technical glitch. Uh, then I'll quickly run through my presentation. Yeah. Dobara mat pushna type presentation. No questions asked now. <laughs> yeah. uh, so now, uh, with so much of clinical theory, uh, clinical, I'll just go through the theory of uh, pelvic parameters. So the importance of uh, uh, sagittal plane deformity. Uh, can't be you know, overemphasized. We know that how important it is. We've been seeing this throughout the entire uh, webinar today. Uh, so, so in a certain study, it has been seen that uh, osteoarthritis disability index is higher when there is lumbar kyphosis compared to normal uh, uh, lumbar uh, lordosis. And uh, Correct sagittal balance is important because it ensures good fusion, allows uh, the, the gravity plumb line to fall exactly where it should be and also preserves adjacent levels. So coming to pelvic parameters, uh, bipedalism is a very distinctive feature of the human race. There are some primates who occasionally walk on two feet, but then in humans, it is the soul under ergonomic and the stable situation of walking with two feet. So this has actually made some changes in the human pelvis and also in the human spine. The human uh, pelvis is more vertical and it is more broad compared to a primate pelvis. And also there, there are these characteristic uh, curves in the sagittal plane of the human spine compared to that of the primate spine. So this is a concept that we very well know that uh, the central center of gravity falls within three centimeters of the uh, bicoxofemoral axis 
and this is the most ergonomic situation. There is very less uh, work involved of the hip muscles and it is a very stable situation. And uh, the stability depends on uh, rather than of active muscle contraction. Uh, so this verticality is actually determined by pelvic morphology and sacral anatomy. So here we can actually consider that sacrum as the base on which the lumbar spine is placed and the rest of the spine balances itself upon this base. So we come to the concept of the pelvic incidence, which was basically uh, put out by a group of French uh, researchers. And uh, I'm just going to go through the basics of pelvic incidence where we have to draw a horizontal line of the sacral and then at the midpoint we drop a perpendicular. This is step one. And then we also identify the center of the femoral head. If there are two of them visible separately, then we'll have to look at the center of both of them and then we draw a line to the center of the sacral dome. So this angle here is what is pelvic incidence is. And if we have a perpendicular line from the uh, bicoxofemoral axis, then that is the pelvic tilt. And the horizontal slope of the sacrum is the sacral slope. Geometrically, we can prove that the pelvic tilt and the sacral slope, if added together, will be equal to the pelvic incidence. Now, uh, the French research also looked at the uh, radiolo looked at the radiological analysis and also saw the normal variation of uh, pelvic incidence, and uh, they found out that it's about 54 is an average, while it varies anywhere between 33 to 82, and uh, the pelvic tilt is about 13 on an average, and sacral slope is about 14, and sacral slope usually corresponds to, or the other way around, the lumbar loss is usually corresponds to the sacral slope. Now, this is a graphical representation of how lumbar lordosis and sacral slope relate to each other. Now, the pelvic incidence is a morphological parameter for that individual. What we have to remember is that once the individual attains skeletal maturity, the pelvic incidence is the same throughout their life. It is basically a spatial position of the pelvis and the sagittal balance is obtained because of the ad adaptation, as I already told earlier, adaptation of other parameters like lumbar lordosis onto this fixed parameter. So is there a normal variation of the pelvic incidence and also normal variation of what we call as lumbar lordosis and thoracic kyphosis? So 160 patients, not patients, actually human volunteers were looked at by a French study again, and they saw that the sacral slope varies in even uh, 20 to 65 degrees and uh, the lumbar lordosis is varied from uh, 41 to 82 degrees and the number of vertical vertebral bodies in the lordotic segment varies anywhere from one to eight vertebral bodies. So this comes to us, brings us to a statement by made by Stagnara where he says that no uh, it is unreasonable to speak of normal kyphotic or lumbar curves because it always varies between a significant range. Uh, and now coming to the concern, uh, what concerns us, that is the importance of spinopelvic balance in spondylolisthesis. Again, I'm quoting a French study where they saw that patients with spondylolisthesis tend to have a higher pelvic incidence, higher sacral slope, and higher pelvic tilt compared to normal volunteers. And uh, this is an example, a pictorial representation of the same, where we see that patients with uh, uh, listhesis have a very high uh, pelvic incidence uh, compared to normal volunteers. So, so this is uh, something that we spoke about in one of the presentations, I think from Guru, where we the friction is what actually holds the lumbar spine above the, uh, uh, above the sacrum. And if the theta increases, then there is a chance that there is a higher slippage, which is actually being held back by the 
intact posterior elements. Now, when we speak about intact posterior elements, if they are disrupted in high-grade spondylolisthesis, like in a dysplastic or an isthmic lysthesis, the pelvic incidence cannot be compensated by a higher lumbar lordosis. And the pelvic retroversion comes in, hip flexion comes in, but even in spite of that, if it can't be compensated, then the entire spine falls forward and then we have imbalance. So in the second picture, we see that there is some amount of lord, uh, lordosis that is increased, some amount of sacral slope that is actually decreased, that is the pelvis tilts backwards. And even in spite of that, if it doesn't, then we have hip flexion. And even in spite of that, if it doesn't compensate, then the body falls forward and then there is imbalance. So there is a study from the US, from uh, Keith Bridwell and uh, Lawrence Lenke, where they have seen that even low-grade isthmic spondylolisthesis, uh, pelvic incidence is higher compared to adult controls and more so in uh, high-grade uh, isthmic spondylolisthesis. So naturally, the, uh, the tendency is for us to look for any markers of spondyloptosis. If we can see if there is anything that can predict spondylolisthesis progression and bring it on to a spondyloptosis. So again, as I already mentioned, the pelvic incidence is very high. That is very easy to, easy to understand. Now, uh, because of this concept, they have actually, uh, the spinal deformity study group has come forward with another classification where they have, of course, duly noted that not all patients with listhesis have a higher uh, pelvic incidence. There are some groups, which they call as the nutcracker group, which have a normal pelvic incidence and also have uh, uh, a, a spondylolisthesis, while most of them have actually higher, higher pelvic incidence with spondylolisthesis. So they classify this uh, group uh, based on three things. One is the grade of slip, which we all know, Meyerdings classification, less than 50 or more than 50. Less than 50 is low or high. Pelvic incidence is low, normal or high. And then the spinopelvic balance is looked at. So how do we do that? We use what is called as the RESCO nomogram, where the, it is actually a ratio between uh, sacral slope and pelvic tilt. Uh, so anywhere below this line, this is actually a high uh, or an imbalanced pelvis or above the line is a balanced pelvis. So they have actually classified this into low grade where this is type one, that is low pelvic incidence and low grade listhesis. Type two is normal pelvic incidence and low grade listhesis. Type three is high pelvic incidence, but yet there is a low grade listhesis. Well, what we should look at is high grade listhesis with the balanced pelvis where the in the nomogram, it is actually above that line. And then the other one is a, an unbalanced pelvis, that is a retroversus pelvis, in which type 5 is a balanced spine, and type 6 is an unbalanced spine. So these are the various scenarios clinically, radi radiographically as seen. We can see that in type 5, it is actually unbalanced, that is the sacral slope is very less, but still the spine is still maintained. While in the last one, the sacral slope is actually less, and then the spine is the patient is actually imbalanced. So what they actually say is, how do we predict in one, two, and three, it is very easy. Even in two, in three, there is no need to reduce is what they say. Uh, type four, uh, we can actually do some attempt at reduction, but then reduction may not be necessary. Five, it, is, it should be attempted and they true to attempt a so there is, once we actually have got a reduction, the lumbar lordosis reestablishes itself, the sacral slope reduces, and then the spine automatically becomes more balanced than what was preoperatively. So this is a study which refutes claims that it is uh, not uh, uh, of its and to sum up, it is an active visible, it remains unchanged throughout our life. So we have a single reference thoracic and lumbar lordosis to compare with, and it is independent of pelvic orientation. So, so even we post uh, pelvic incidence predisposed to spondylolisthesis and 
with nonsense with this place what happens to them so with this i actually quick, quickly conclude my talk thank you thank you raghavendra for a excellent presentation because we were getting lot of calls from uh, and smss for uh, from the uh, some fellows uh, that they wanted to understand this better and uh, none other than you because we thought a uh, lot of french guys have this origin uh, for this uh, spondylolisthesis and uh, pelvic incidence and that was a very good uh, understanding for all of us thank you very much and we proceed with uh, dr vivek vincent now uh, i would just like uh, to run through uh, cases and we'll have only one answer, uh, one question at the end of it from raghav sir uh, or dr ajaya as we need to cover up uh, as cases are important now so we'll just run through cases yes vivek uh, uh, can you can you all see me yeah yeah so this is a 56 year old female uh, back pain with lower limb radiation claudication distance about 50 meters and she had a left ehl edl of around grade 3 by 5 so this is her uh, uh, x ray where we can see there is an uh, degenerative scoliosis a lateral lysthesis at l3 4 i sorry i don't have the uh, flexion extension x rays but there was a slight uh, grade 1 lysthesis at l45 uh, we got an mri done which shows a stenosis at uh, l45 and l5 s1 i would like any of the panelists would like to comment on what would be their uh, level of fixation and plan of management in this case yes raghav sir uh, yeah me yes this is you know a deformity situation here and the problem at l45 is a localized problem of an extending deformity that nobody should touch this lady without a full length x ray today from yes. e1 to to the hips and you see it should be standing x rays correct see how much is deformity and lateral bending yes so she's only 56 she is young so right. if you address the deformity you can give a good relief by solving the localized problem at l45 by any form of decompression and fixation but if there is in the in the lumbar spine if there's more than 30 degrees of coronal plane instability most of them would go into low back pain and further deterioration quite well taken sir yes wait what did you do so uh, i decided to go a level above i decided to fix from uh, l3 to l5 and do a t lift at l4 5 a decompression from l3 to l5 was done uh, this is immediate post op and this is at about a year follow up uh would yeah, anyone look at looking at uh, the uh, pre operative uh, de degenerative scoliosis this looks a very good follow up at one year and uh, as raghav sir said that uh, is mandatory to have a whole spine or a scout film so that we can always uh, be sure about the outcomes it must be done i'm sure because of the time constraint uh, it's not been uh, yes. shown here yes yes kunal any quick comment and then we proceed to the next case kunal Yes, Neeraj. Any quick comment? Well, I have, you know, I mean, a few. I think, you know, as Raghav sir said, you know, we definitely want a long cassette, but I would want a standing and lying down AP as well, just to see that how much deformity is collapsing. If yes. deformity is not collapsing, then I think, you know, I would not uh, do a fixation. I'll just do a decompression and get away with that. You will do a decompression. Yes, Kunal. Sir, uh, L3 for axial images, if they can show. No, no, no. Just do it again. Don't ask. Now, what is that? Looking at. Uh, This is rapid fire. Here, rapid fire now. Yeah. Good enough fixation. Good. Good. Yes, Ajaya. It looks very reasonable. I I I think this is a good outcome um, at this point, and um, it's helpful to just remember that sometimes cages placed asymmetrically or two cages at a level with differential height can help um, pr uh, promote a curve if that's helpful for maintaining balance. um just as a as one option to keep in mind perfect well said guys and uh, we would like to, uh, to thank vivek very well thank done you. job and um, you try to uh, achieve both the things try to reduce the deformity as well as uh, the decompression and stabilization well done vivek and over to you dr pradeep singh from hiranandani hospital mumbai pradeep please share your case
<coughs> right. Can you see me? Yes. And I'll just jump to my case on there. Yes, yes, no problem. Right, yeah. This lady, 56 year old, with diabetes, hypertension, and mild schizophrenic she was, and uh, was having uh, osteoarthritis, both knee bel in valgus deformity, a grade 1 to 2 L4 5 spondylolisthesis, straightforward case for any T lift. Right, so this is pre op MRI, which shows listhesis. This is superior inferior, you know. Uh, Collapse causing some prominent stenosis and lateral lasis stenosis. So, standard pre operative workup done, knee evaluation and orthoplasty was cons surgeon was consulted, diabetes and psychiatric evaluation were done, counseling was done, and scheduled for surgery. So, this was done, open T lip standard, uh, peak cage with a lot of bone graft there, still some residual uh, uh, deformity there, but she did well for six months. And then we start walking and because of the valgus knee, I mean, her walk was not that great and she tend to fall frequently and this, she fell down. And she came with this X-ray. So you can see here, this is screw is okay, but L5 screw and the vertebral height of the L5 body is collapsing. And again, after one year, this was the picture. It's complete collapse of this uh, uh, L5 vertebral body, retropulse fragment, which was pressing uh, over the nerve root on the right side. This is AP view. Any comments, sir? Yes, Guru. Any co quick comments? Uh, basically, uh, I would like to uh, have an MRI. Yeah. So I have a strong suspicion of infection when you see a lytic kind of a body which is progressive. Yeah, MRI was, I don't have now, MRI was done, CT was done, no infection there, only osteoporotic fracture. And then what, what, is, what, what, what is her complaint right now? The complaint was backache and radicular pain on the right side, no neurological deficit. So if backache and radicular pain are severe and uh, affecting her day routine activities, then we need to revise this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did that. Yes. So yes, quick you. comment. Kuna. Just a small question. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, Dr. Mayur here. Uh, had you done a CT over there to see yeah. whether there was a fusion uh, at that level? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the vertebras were fused. Only thing in a retropulse uh -huh. fragment which is causing pressure and the fracture was causing pain. Okay. So if there's a segmental fusion which you had attempted to fuse, um, just a question to you and all the panelists, could we just do a localized decompression over there because that segment is already fused, uh, decompress your nerve roots and uh, uh, be done with the surgery or you still would want to extend this fusion all the way? Yes, Raghavendra. Raghavendra? Yes, Kunal. Uh, yep. This was looking like a pure mechanical failure. If, if, uh, if there is no history of uh, infection and there is no signs of infection, so it's a good result. Maybe some cage or something at uh, L4 5 level. Would you try something like cage or something? Yeah, or so cage could not be removed. Cage is left as in situ. Okay. Yeah. So fusion was there. probably anterior fusion there and posterior fractured part of the L5 vertebral body obviously not fused, was moving and that could be the cause of the pain. And were you able to uh, put L5 screws in different? Uh, Trajectory, just I could not. I could not. I think well done job. Nice. Uh, nice. Definitely, nice. it was a very challenging uh, one. Any quick comment, Ajaya? I think what we should do. Sorry, Ajaya. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, you can, you can, you can, sir. The question is, why is she falling? Is the cervical spine okay? Yes, sir. Right. Valgus knee, sir. Osteoarthritic valgus knee. Knock knee. Knock knee. Yeah. The cervical spine is okay. The cervical spine perfectly fine, yeah. Okay. So, what was the cause of that uh, resorption? The fall, fracture. So, very similar to what Guru presented us with. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I think you've done a very good job. At the end of it, uh, ultimately, result matters. How many months now, or uh, uh, post op? Uh, one year. Pradeep? One year uh, post second surgery is, is doing good. Only she developed some neuropraxia on the right side, and she, okay. I mean, she recovered eventually. Absolutely, very good. Well done, job to right. you and your team. Uh, I would request Dr. Mayur to uh, proceed with his uh, uh, presentation. Mayur. Yes, sir. and see this this different cases are really a lot of learning because through these cases we understand what what must be the problem all these things standing x rays whole spine scout x rays ct scan what is important blood parameters all these things are very very right. important when we plan to revise the implant yes mayur yes sir so uh, are you able to see my screen with a single yeah, yeah. slide or is it a... it's a okay. single slide you can just yeah in yeah okay thank you so this is a 65 yeah you, is it moving presenters view presenters view yeah, it is a presenter view can you change it yeah yeah i'll do it Mayur? yes i'll do it i'll do it yeah yeah yes now yeah, yeah. go go ahead so, now, because we're running off short, short of time we'll have to yeah. Yeah, proceed yes sir yes sir 65 year old lady with back and leg pain since 2 years and it was aggravated since 2 weeks and now she was having difficulty in walking Uh, past history she was diabetic chronic renal failure and was undergoing hemodialysis two times a week now this is a x ray grade 1 lytic listhesis and uh, she had a abdominal ct for some reason so in a emr i could pull out her images so there was definitely a lytic listhesis over here with foraminal stenosis uh, grade 1 slit and uh, this is the past defect that i could see and i ordered for an mri now uh, would anyone like to take over and comment on this yeah yeah um, yes. okay again no, no, disc enhancement that's the first thing whenever yeah. you see a disc enhancement in the first thing is infection if that yeah. is fall you know accompanied by bilateral uh, sorry end plate edema above and below you need to be very careful i can see some edema and some disc space enhancement there Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. very well picked up. Very well taken, sir. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. So even I had this suspicion that a patient with a disc space edema, sudden aggravation of pain, uh, whereas she had a, she was doing okay for all these years, and sudden aggravation of pain that led me to a suspicion. Uh, hemogram, uh, her hemoglobin was eight point eight, PLC slightly uh, risen up, ESR sixty nine, mm. CRP forty three. now when i spoke to the nephrologist he says that with hemodialysis these uh, parameters may not be too significant but still i had a very high index of suspicion uh, i told the patient that this could be infection uh, initially they did not agree they wanted to try a root block which i did not agree to i asked for a blood culture and she grew mrsa and was sensitive to tcoplanin they did not want any intervention at this point of time went ahead with iv antibiotics and after 3 weeks her pain progressed to a really uh, bigger extent and she was not even able to move in bed right now and she had developed hearing difficulty because of tcoplanin toxicity and they insisted me to get another mri and now this was the picture so a lytic listhesis with a infected disc really? this actually uh, yeah in literature this is very rare uh, all i could trace was six cases till now Uh, of lytic listhesis accompanied with spondylodiscitis the actual incidence may be higher i don't doubt that so what could be the treatment options at this point of time see what's can i can i say something yes sir yes sir yes, what happening is no journal takes other than chinese journals case reports right even asian spine journal does not take any more case reports yes sir this is a major problem no uh, we have treated quite a few infected uh, is spondylo discitis in hemo uh, dialysis patients it's very yeah. common it's not uncommon at all the yes yes that it is this is just an you know an incidental thing yeah so uh, pre existing dialysis are more prone they are immune compromised infections are very common and especially with multiple transfusions gram-negative infections are quite common in these patients yes sir yes sir. i agree sir yes so, so treatment plan now Uh, so, uh, Mayur, how severe is her back pain? 
really severe not even able to move uh, from and one side okay. to the other okay so i would do just a l3 l4 um, fixation and uh, mm -hmm. disc debridement and bone graft there because this okay. is already collapsed to very severe extent there is no not, not much of a space there i would not yeah. put, don't want to put any okay. cage or anything yes been said quick yeah one thing yeah yeah i think uh, we need to debride fix and uh, Uh, clean out the disc material and find out what it exactly is happening. Ajay, yeah. more important. Any rule of anterior? Very much so in my hands. Given the direct lateral strategy, uh, anterior is fine. But I would do this uh, direct lateral. Get through the psoas. You can sample. You can debride. You can pack with bone graft. There are times I've done staged procedures where you put antibiotics in polymethyl methacrylate on a bead of suture. You know, if you needed to come back for a second look. um having said that if you can bone graft which i've done with structural graft then you flip and do percutaneous screws you don't have to uh do an open procedure worry about wound healing or go past the spinal canal yeah interesting okay. ajay yeah. your outlook because uh, uh yeah. you can go either way you yeah pradeep yeah so i would go for endoscopic you know debridement of intradiscal whatever label is and maybe percutaneous uh, fixation with or without percutaneous fixation absolutely well yeah. well said pradeep uh, and we have three options direct go posterior decompress and fix uh, go endoscopic yeah. uh, laval decompress and percutaneous fixation and direct lateral yes my what did you yeah. do so i initially thought of endoscopic uh, debridement but the disc space being so collapsed i was not really sure whether i would get in over there so i actually i prefer anteriors for these cases uh, you can directly reach the uh, actual lesion you can do a good discectomy so i did a, a olef approach uh, anterior uh, lateral uh, retroperitoneal and the moment i put in uh, the first dilator into the disc space this was the first pouring out so and then the surgery went ahead um, a, a standard olef approach good disc space debridement and uh, Uh, as i did my debridement and uh, did serial dilatation of the disc space the lysthesis is also reduced well and then i could put a big uh, 12 mm by 55 mm cage filled with autologous bone graft along with vancomycin so got a good reduction there and then flipped over and uh, cannulated the pedicles uh, under the outside view and uh, did a percutaneous fixation so this is the intra op picture good uh, reduction of the lysthesis good foraminal decompression got a good material which i could send for histopath and biopsy and in that uh, again uh, grew the organism and this is 3 months post op i don't have a longer follow up right now and she is holding well uh, she is happy she is walking around her pain is not there and uh, pretty grateful this is a clinical the olive incision the electrest incision and the stab incisions for the pedicle screws Great compliment, yeah, yeah, very well, very done. well done. Excellent job. The, yes, the only, Excellent. sorry, the very well done. I agree with that. The only caveat I would say is that uh, structural allograft versus or autograft. I understand allograft is limited in in the Indian setting, but structural yeah. autograft. The advantage is if you get full incorporation, you could even stop suppression antibiotics one day and take out those percutaneous screws or not. but um mm -hmm. this cage is worrisome for having to continue uh some sort of antibiotic coverage i don't know if that's how you would yeah. think about it but uh, yeah until the fusion i'm very uh, well done okay. mayur and uh, it it's uh, all Probably. great because it's all a challenging case with lot of morbidities you could go anterior do a very good thorough debridement with olef and put a cage fixed behind Uh, all is uh, right when it goes right and uh, there is no question that you did a very good job over to you uh, neelaj yes, please uh, proceed with your next presentation you. uh it's my turn right yeah okay so i had actually compiled a few cases but i'll just quickly go through one or two cases if possible depending yeah, on yeah no time. no questions asked now neelaj you can just shoot through yeah so i'll just you know and try to cover some points you know this is a male of 62 years operated for uh, lumbar spine surgery elsewhere about 5 years back the index surgeon surgeon did l4 5 5s 5s1 uh, postural lumbar uh, postural lateral fusion patient came to me with severe cloud claudication diabetic and uh, no obesity very lean and thin patient so this where the uh, pictures for the patient you can clearly see there is significant sagittal imbalance you know even in extension the trunk is falling forward 
right you know the reflection there is total a flat back over here the 45 is one has been fixed in a uh, 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 kind of a flat back situation and uh, the spine above is totally falling now the challenging part was you know this is the uh, pelvic parameter for the patient pi was around 46 uh, the l45 the lower lumbar low doses was only 15 degree and the overall low doses was around the 21 degree in a uh, uh, this case you can see the pelvic tilt is approaching 20 degree this is the mri the patient definitely has uh, the adjacent level th about three level stenosis and a flat back below so probably you know we are dealing here with uh, two sets of problem one uh, whether to restore sagittal balance considering every level which has been fused or only to decompress and try to correct above the fusion level the another challenge was in the ct scan if you see there is a huge amount of posterior bone formation when i went inside you know this was around 1 and 1/2 to 2 inch thick bone uh, from transverse process to transverse process including in the laminar space so there was a huge fusion mass here which was uh, uh, preventing the approach and access uh, to go into the lower lumbar fusion the questions were you know how much to fuse how much long to fuse whether to go for uh, the the osteotomy of this fusion mass and try to restore the sagittal uh, parameter for this patient so this is finally what we did was you know we decided to break entire fusion and fortunately it was only a posterolateral and posterior fusion so the disc space was still virgin so we could do an osteoclysis at the fusion mass posteriorly it took almost 3 to 4 hours only to go into this fusion mass it was 2 inches thick i had used uh, the the uh, the scalpel and everything still it took lot of time to go inside try to restore the lumbar low doses you can see that lumbar low doses we could restore to 50 50 degree from pre op of only 21 degree by putting each level cage and fairly decent sagittal alignment came and patient started walking fairly well i'll quickly go to the second phase you know I and mean, then maybe we can take few questions else if you agree to that uh, this is because you know this is also in the sagittal parameter kind of a thing only so this is a female of 58 years operated for lumbar spine stenosis elsewhere two month post index surgery patient came with a wheelchair significant back pain vas was 8 on 10 s1 dermatomal pain on right side uh, vas was 5 on 10 bedridden wheelchair bound neurology intact dexa of hip because you know i mean patient has already been implanted and there was no pre op dexa available so we only uh, uh, detected the hip dexa which was minus 1.9 no com comorbidity so these are the x rays good through elas so these these are the x rays of the patient uh pretty looking good but you know if you try to evaluate sagittal parameters you know this mri is also looks good but patient was totally bedridden and if you see on further images uh with ct scan you can see that s1 screw is bilaterally getting loose it is getting plowed out and one of the reason would be that patient sagittal parameter were off balance when you know multi level fusion was attempted the pi was almost 70 degree you know it was a high pi patient and the restored lumbar low doses post surgery was only 48 degree so there was pi minus ll mismatch of almost 22 degree to this patient pelvic tilt was going significantly higher 27 in a comparatively younger lady these parameters are very much non forgiving and that led to probably you know i mean screw loosening because you know i mean your spine was trying to compensate and uh, the pelvis was trying to compensate your whatever deformity and we had fixed that so you know that led to loosening at alpha s1 level and this is what we did post post operatively uh, we revised entire structure we uh, the the, uh, the s1 screws both were completely loose so if you see on the left side we have used the sacral as sacral s1 lr screw only and then we supplemented it with uh, the uh, s2 ai screw yeah and the other side l1 uh, the s1 screw on the other side was pretty straight so we can angulate the screw on more medial and could get a better purchase of this patient and we can also restore a good sagittal parameter for this patient we could uh, uh, come down your the pi minus ll to 5 degree because you know the resulting lumbar low doses was 65 so these are just two cases to uh, stress upon the uh, segmental uh sagittal imbalance because you know if you while doing a long fixation if you don't respect your sagittal balance your patients are bound to fail so this is more like a mechanical failure than the implant failure very well to, to, yeah, just, you can you can summarize one, one more case you already pre prepared so maybe 2 minutes but it won't uh, sure, I, i'll i'll yeah. go ahead if you say i have yes. So yes. this is uh, a female of 82 years patient pre patient presented initially with L3 compression fracture Uh, treated elsewhere with uh, uh, vertebroplasty by a pain physician patient was in reading pain when came to us totally bedridden and dexa was minus 3.5 so significant the osteoporosis 
uh, BMI was 21, so pretty lean and thin patient. Nutrition was pretty normal. So this was the first x-ray when patient came to me and then patient went up to somebody else and this is what the x-ray with patient came when patient was in a disabling pain. You can, this is a supine x-ray and when we did the seating x-ray because patient was not able to stand, you can see that spine was collapsing uh, further. Now the challenges were it was a difficult case because uh, already been do, done a vertebroplasty collapsing at the vertebral junction, uh, osteoporosis was significant. This is what we did, you know, immediately we restored the sagittal balance of the patient. If you see, but the inflection point is coming right at the top of the level. So I decided to put a cement one level above just to prevent a, a PJK for this patient. But the inflection point of thoracic kyphosis of lumbar lordosis was coming right at the level where I had stopped which was a mistake and you can see that gradually patient's screw started loosening up. So I, I wrongly ended that L1, I should have gone to T10 in this patient because the inflection point in previous patient was quite higher and in this particular patient, the inflection point was coming right at L1. And this patient came with, you know, patient was managing quite well. Uh, some amount of back pain was still not able to stand long, but, you know, patient was walking at least, you know, I mean, one hour, two hour a day. So we decided to conserve this patient. And very recently, two days back, only the patient came. And I don't have the x-ray with me, but this entire area has fused and we uh, were refrained from revising it. So, I mean, in PJK, sometimes conservative treatment also helps in this kind of a patient. I must compliment for excellent work which uh, you have shown, Neeraj, because they are all challenging cases, uh, elderly, degenerative, uh, adult scolies with phone, uh, you know, uh, DEXA minus uh, 3.5 or so, and age, porosis, all these uh, issues are going to happen. Uh, DJK and PJK are uh, definitely an uh, worry something. We need to closely follow up these cases. Any quick comment, Guru? I think, no. Uh... Well done, well done. I would like to ask one question to Dr. Neeraj. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the first case, which you presented with the L3 to L5 uh, PLF, like the normal teaching is if you have a good uh, posterolateral fusion, implant failure is not really seen. But was there any infection leading to the implant failure or is it? Well, Just, I guess uh, no, it, was, it was not an implant failure case per se. You know, there were some back out of screw, but I think majorly it was adjacent segment disorder uh, coming out of probably wrongly done a flat back fusion for this patient. So that led to, uh, I actually, you know, stopped my screen sharing because I wanted to save time. But if you see that L1, 2, 2, 3 and 3, 4, about three level where, you know, steno getting stenotic because spine was falling forward. So it was rather, you know, I mean, uh, poorly executed surgical plan rather than the implant issues in this. Only comment is I would have used a, a cement augmented screw at the top. Uh, if you see the screws are backing out and they are cutting or uh, cutting through. Top. Yeah, that the last case, last case. Yeah. Yes, you know I agree that you know I mean from that case onward I have started actually you know I mean doing a cemented screw at top level and yes. additional one vertebroplasty above one level. I, yeah. that, I, that would have been excellent uh, presentation, Neeraj. And now uh, we'll just go through the last uh, phase of our uh, webinar today. I will be quickly covering few cases, uh, basically for understanding which all different issues uh, we have tackled and can be done uh, in this uh, kind of lumbar instability and implant failure. We'll be going through the rapid fire. This is a, a L5 S1 lytic listhesis, 55 year old female with back and leg pain, persistent, not better. And uh, most important is always have a pre and post operative scout films and uh, uh, they really do well if it is addressed well. 70-year-old uh, female uh, with uh, difficulty in walking, uh, back pain, leg pain, claudication. Uh, step was clearly positive at lumbosacral region. Uh, osteoporosis, degenerative scoliosis, uh, grade 2 to 3 listhesis, and severe compression. They are the real challenging cases at times because if you see the compression was quite severe with degenerative scoliosis. We uh, have started using this screw in last four five years where uh, they are the corticocancellous uh, screws dual uh, threaded and we did a transpedicular transdiscal uh, fixation TPDC what we call a delta fixation and now it's all, this is our wife um, mother of a pediatric uh, specialist and doing really fine mobilized and a uh, few interesting cases like this significant instability l5 or s1 spondyloptosis uh, grade 4 to grade 5 and uh, they are the challenging ones we have to be very careful because it's we have to have all the uh, uh, 
uh, X-ray, MRI, CT scans with us. We have to study it well. We should know our maneuvers. We should know our backup options in this case where we need to do decompression very well we need to do a dome ostotomy we need to reduce whether we can use reduction screws or distract it by putting screws higher level these are all very very uh, interesting uh, challenges which we all face in our routine practice and uh, when there is a severe compression we use this uh, as uh, additional uh, uh, screws we normally prefer to use at three or two and we distract slowly you have to have very good clearance you have to do a very good uh, uh, release around uh, the uh, anterior segment and you have to be very careful at times now roots are passing the traversing and exiting roots you have to identify uh, uh, that is the most important key we prefer to use neuro monitoring in these kind of high grades at times you don't get the reduction despite of your good releases and distractions we have to use sometimes the manual uh, hip extension we have to keep it ready at times uh, uh, different maneuvers can be used and uh, we can get a uh, good outcomes in this. You can use uh, additional level also if you are in uh, trouble, but uh, you can get away at mono segment also. Again, uh, lumbosacral kyphosis is a challenge uh, because uh, at times it is very, very important for addressing both stenosis as well as, as kyphoscoliosis in lumbar spine. And we have to uh, use our... Uh, our uh, uh, di uh, different ostotomies, posterior column ostotomies, pontis wisely, multi level ostotomies can give a good release, and these patients can really uh, come up with very good outcomes. Nowadays, as uh, we are seeing more and more uh, issues with complex cases with deformities, we see these kind of patients with back and uh, leg pain, difficulty to even sit for 20 30 minutes, dis significantly disabled, twice operated before. And what we can see here is a significant deformity, lumbar kyphosis, uh, uh, a cage at the apex of lumbar kyphosis with broken implant and severe leg pain, completely listed body. You really cannot uh, work like this for long. And if you see, there is a long segment decompression also was done. These are the challenges where we have to do all very good uh, workup. Again, uh, good uh, CTs and MRIs detailed study of this uh, uh, deformities and we can uh, get away uh, with uh, these kind of deformities also. Most important in this case was identifying the cage, getting the cage out. Otherwise, uh, correcting the kyphosis was really difficult and we really were lucky to get a good outcome in this. We used uh, interbody in the lumbar segment and we distracted, we did all the uh, ostrotomy is three to four level here and we were lucky if you see the deformity pre-operative and post-op we were really lucky to get a very good outcome now this is a near more than one to two years and this man is uh, driving his car independently and uh, he's regularly coming to us at six month follow-up we want to follow up with this again 68 year old female a lumbar scoliosis uh, and significant uh, uh, deformity, lateral listhesis, previously operated once and double level compression, severe pain, we can go with, uh, she was not keen for again decompression as she was already, uh, she had undergone a decompression MIS way, uh, we did a decompression as well as stabilization in this particular lady. We do see back out of implants in uh, patients with some amount of porosis uh, and uh, here we see that the uh, implant was poking and creating a lot of stress on this particular gentleman where we had to use this BMP and uh, we fixed him uh, where we are so far happy with the outcomes and some cases like this where we don't address the instability well, we can have problem. This case was operated elsewhere twice by the same surgeon. Probably uh, there was a lytic listhesis. We don't have the preoperative x-ray and this was the uh, x-ray where, where we see the screws in both the L5, but there was no interbody support. This patient was in persistent pain. Therefore, they revised it and they did the uh, left-sided screw removal. If you see this x-ray and still the patient was in terrible pain, the patient came to us after three to four weeks where we saw everything looked okay, MR. We thought of uh, giving a pain block and uh, because of the pain was intolerable, we gave him the block, we sent him, uh, but uh, he came back in two weeks with terrible pain. 
where we had to revise him and we did an interbody and it settled now it is reasonably a long follow up this was a old slide but he is really doing very good now uh, these are the challenges in the revisions uh, cases because we do see more of lumbar revisions nowadays and this is twice operated elsewhere weakness lumbar kyphosis again again a challenge because previously operated fibrous tissue scar significant adhesions can be a trouble and uh, we need to do all the detailed study as uh, everyone was talking we should have all the ct scans mris proper x rays dynamic x rays whole spine x rays and we can uh, uh, plan it well we can discuss uh, in case of doubt with your colleagues uh, and you can have a team approach and this is uh, we have a reasonably good experience of these kind of revisions where, where we got away very well in this case again with multi level decompression uh, and fixation we went all posterior and uh, with lateral posterior lateral fascicle release and anterior clearance and we did anterior decompression where we could get away with the deformity and because of the fascicle release we could get away with uh, both uh, the deformity as well as uh, compression and finally this gentleman is doing very fine and we are lucky with uh, his so far uh, nearly 6 8 month follow up and is walking well i will not go into the video because uh, again we are running short of time but uh, i would like uh, to hand over to the panel for any additional inputs thank you very much i think uh, uh, salesh can i speak yes sir right this is about uh, neeraj's uh, last case the vertebroplasty case right yes sir 80 year old lady if i am right yes yes sir. yeah see we were uh, one of the uh, my center was one of the highest uh, number of vertebroplasty centers in india at one time uh, before a lot of other people took over and started doing vertebroplasty as we started uh, way back in the 90s and i'm totally disappointed with a lot of vertebroplasties i gave uh, lots of lectures presented published but looking back a lot of i'm only talking about indian patients a lot of these old people with fractures they do well if you wait right you need to reassure them that's all it requires so they are in severe pain but they get better if you wait because you know in korea i've seen in dejon 4 years ago in the national annual conference they went on from ilm to occiput this fixations so adjacent segment pjk going up 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 so i think for if some of the youngsters listening to this uh, uh, this uh, webinar please be careful please be careful our patients are different our uh, it's a normal natural thing to bend forwards i wouldn't yeah. believe the western literature right you're doing unnatural things by trying to straighten them up by looking at sagi maps and all these calculations so old people respect their age respect their uh, osteoporosis most of the bmps again are all complete rubbish we know that when the bm uh, so not bmp the bone mineral density bm so when we do these studies initially they they are very good when you put screws the bone feels very osteopenic or osteoporotic so you need to have a lot of patience with these old people not interfere as far as possible believe me that is the best way and as a senior uh, surgeon that's my advice keep your hands off all these old people don't go by literature yes sir, another thing uh, another thing sir for that patient that pain physician even did some endoscopy i don't know for what reason god knows right interfering with old age is a crime except when necessary i would say uh to echo that that's very well said i think older people the parameters should be different so you can accept a i, I think using the parameters is still fair pelvic incidence and uh um the uh lumbar lordosis uh sagittal vertical axis you know but the mismatches can be more um uh larger uh magnitude number 1 um the international spine study group is a great resource i think the literature in that presentation that we heard just now was excellent but there's a t1 pelvic angle as well that's really worth discussing at some later point if i could just make a couple of comments and then i i um do need to jump over to another morning commitment here number 1 is uh 
uh, osteoporosis, th those are very um, uh, prudent comments. And, uh, you know, be mindful of things like FRAX, F-R-A-X, validated in different populations. And, and the bone mineral density is, does not always tell the whole story. That's absolutely true. Um, I did share with Dr. Shailesh the uh, a Grand Rounds talk that I gave earlier that he can, you know, distribute to the group. It's about different correction techniques and um, it just supplements what we covered. Uh, that's number two. And um, Fred Sweet is a very innovative person in Illinois, and he writes about and has done TFAR. So we talk from different contexts, right? And over here, I have access to things like easily, like navigation, direct lateral and implants and BMP and allograft that you might not necessarily, but you still do phenomenal work. And we you know, speak the same language. We're really the same community. But the TFAR, transforaminal anterior release, is nice because it's all posterior um, and it's not special equipment or monitoring, but it can let you get phenomenal sagittal correction. We could talk about that in a future session. So uh, not to take over the podium, but I'm just going to excuse myself, but with great gratitude and appreciation to um, Dr. Shailesh for the invitation and inclusion today. Really a pleasure interacting with you all. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ajay, for your uh, time for uh, today's webinar. As we have uh, uh, nearly uh, completed most of our uh, discussions about balance and uh, imbalance in the spine, stability and instability in spine, pelvic parameters, implant failure in a short span of two and a half uh, hours. And uh, we were really lucky to be with Raghav, sir. Uh, uh, Neeraj, uh, Dr. Guru, uh, Raghavendra, uh, Pradeep, Kunal, uh, Mayur, and Vivek Vincent for giving your real inputs, uh, which probably will be useful for our uh, junior colleagues and uh, those who can uh, you know, relate to their issues in lumbar instability and implant failure. Thank you all for a great uh, evening and looking forward for seeing you soon. Uh, stay safe. Thank you. Uh, I would really uh, like to extend my thanks to Ortho TV, uh, Dr. Neeraj Bijlani and Dr. Ashok Sham for a great uh, support which they are giving us as well as Pune Orthopedic Society and Pune Association of Spine Surgeons. I would like uh, Mayur to uh, say uh, two words from Pune Association of Spine Surgeons. Uh, yes, yes, Mayur. Yeah. Uh, excellent, actually. Excellent uh, arrangement of this webinar. Uh, we are really thankful to Pune Orthopedic Society for uh, uh, building up this platform and getting all of us together. And really thankful to you, Dr. Shailesh Hadgaokar, to get all these stalwarts together and um, help us learn from each other. Uh, such kind of educational activities go a long way uh, to build the knowledge of the spine community. Thank you very much. And the best thing is that this is going to be lifelong on the digital platform. So whenever uh, we or any other of our colleagues want to refer or get back to these webinars, they can easily uh, log in and uh, see these things again. So thank you so much for all your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, guys. Bye-bye. Neeraj, we'll leave you on to the beaches in Goa. And, uh... <laughs>